Morning, morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. You give it inside the Beltway live on Election Day. Not everywhere, but it's Election Day in Virginia and New Jersey and Ohio and places across the United States electing local officials. Governors are on the ballot this morning in New Jersey and Virginia. Glenn Youngkin, the Republican nominee in Virginia, has run through the tape. Terry McAuliffe is close to conceding already. He held the worst rally of a long and terrible campaign, Terry McAuliffe did yesterday. Glenn Youngkin will be joining me in hour two today, talking again about the same tropes he's used from the beginning. Cut number three, Terry McAuliffe yesterday. He talks about critical race theory. Let's be clear, folks. Critical race theory has never been taught in the Commonwealth of Virginia. He says day one he's going to ban it. He's going to ban something that doesn't exist. So Terry is yelling at people that they don't know what they're talking about when they see, feel, touch CRT everywhere. As with the closing of Thomas Jefferson High School in Northern Virginia on the basis of merit, moving towards a race-based selection criteria. That is critical race theory impacting schools. There are other more obvious examples throughout the Commonwealth, and people who know about it know about it. And they, they see it. They talk to teachers about it. They see their children indoctrinated, and they hate it. And Terry says, in fact, they are the racist problem. Cut number four, Terry McAuliffe yesterday. What bothers me to my core <clears throat> is what this man is doing. He's dividing parents against parents, parents against school boards. He's using your children as political pawns in his campaign. It is a racist dog whistle. Folks, we are better than that. Yes, we, are. we will not have that hatred here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. You know, the attempt to define parents concerned with their children's education as racist has backfired on Terry McAuliffe. It did not motivate the black vote. And it certainly did motivate the Anglo vote. They are out there marching, as it did the Asian American vote and the Latino vote. There is a, a number of stories, but i got to finish first. Terry McAuliffe really putting his finger on it yesterday. Cut number five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. So let's diversify. So here's what I'm going to do. We'll be the first state in America. If you'll teach for five years here in Virginia in a high-demand area, that it be geographic or coursework, we will pay room, board, and tuition at any college, any university, any HBCU here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So let's go back and listen to that again. Because I think Terry McAuliffe just proposed using race-based hiring for teachers in the Commonwealth cut number uh, five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know okay, stop we right there. What does that mean? That means if you're a white teacher, Terry's going to push you aside. At least until we get to 50%, 50%. That, by the way, is an unconstitutional proposition hiring by race. I think Terry McAuliffe has great trouble getting excitement among the African-American electorate, which is traditionally turned out for Joe Biden and Democrats. They don't like Terry. They're not turning out for him. They're staying home. It's cold in Virginia this morning, and they're just saying no. They also don't like hysteria. Here's a hysterical Terry McAuliffe yesterday, cut number six. He doesn't believe the nurse working in a cancer ward should be required to be vaccinated. I happen to believe it. He doesn't believe, he says, day one, all masks come off and all vaccine requirements of teachers goes away. That will not happen with Governor Terry McAuliffe. Let me tell you this. We got to protect our students. Today, 1,142 of our children have been hospitalized with COVID. We just lost two 11-year-olds. Do you really want parents here sending your child to first grade where the teacher's not vaccinated? They're not wearing masks? No. Well, that's what you get with Glenn Trump. 1,100 students hospitalized with COVID. I don't know that that's true. I know, sadly, that there are 19 children in the ICUs of Virginia right now with COVID-related illnesses. I strongly encourage you to get vaccinated. Strongly encourage you to check with your doctor about your kids if they don't have underlying uh, conditions, they ought to get vaccinated. 
Uh, I'm sure Glenn Youngkin is pro-vaccine. However, however, no need to scare parents. There's no need to take a horrible situation and make it worse for those kids who are suffering and those families who are suffering by saying that they are not as unique as they are. Glenn Youngkin went up on the air yesterday with a new ad, cut number seven. Terry McAuliffe wants to make this about a man who's not on the ballot in Virginia. Terry McAuliffe's campaign in Virginia is all about Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Trump. Donald Trump. 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 Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. 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 Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Trump. Donald Trump. 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 Donald Trump. Trump. Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump, Donald Thank Trump, you, Trump Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Trump, Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump. He keeps invoking right. Trump. Donald Trump, Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Trump, Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump, Trump, Donald Trump. Have you made this race too much about Trump? Uh, no. Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Trump, Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Trump, Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, 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 Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, 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 making sure that uh, the CRT is gone, that we get back to basics. And people forget the critical issue that powered Glenn Youngkin in the primary. Uh, Weeks before the primary, the Virginia Department of Education said, we will no longer offer accelerated math courses to any student before the 11th grade. That's insane. That's just stupid and ideological and based on equity, which is itself based on CRT, which is itself based on uh, critical theory generally, which began at Harvard Law School in the late 70s and is now spread out to poison the water and wells across the United States as varied as Virginia's uh, teaching mandate. Uh, at ra- Terry's got race on the mind, but the black population is just saying, no, nah, I don't think so. Some are going to come out and vote for Princess Blanding, who is a third-party candidate who Terry bested in the uh, Democratic primary. I believe it was Princess Blanding. And in any event, Terry is worn out And now to the stories, the Washington Post. Virginia went big for Biden, but on eve of another pivotal election, many voters say Democrats have not delivered for them. Cleve Woodson writing that uh, story by story about how Biden won Virginia by 10 points. Terry's likely to lose it tonight by a lot. I don't know if it'll get to double digits. Polls show Democrats want to replace Biden on the ballot in 2024, according to Aaron Blake in the Washington Post. No surprise that he's pulling down McAuliffe in Virginia. Donald Trump urged voters to turn out for Yunkin in Virginia election, uh, governor election, according to the New York Post. The former president making a conference call with his supporters last night saying that they've got to get out and vote for Terry, uh, for Glenn Yunkin. If Glenn Yunkin pulls off a win, he'll likely have Hispanic and Asian voters to thank, according to my fellow colleague at the Washington Post, Henry um, Olson. And I have an opinion column over on the front page of the Washington Post landing page. Count on Democrats to ignore the lessons of a Yunkin win. It begins. It will surprise no one that I think Glenn Yunkin is going to win Tuesday's vote in the Virginia governor's race. Former Governor Terry McAuliffe spent Sunday morning on Meet the Press, which was an appeal for help to the Beltway suburbs, where the Sunday shows matter far more than they do in Virginia Beach, Richmond, and Lynchburg, much less rural Virginia. While Yunkin was barnstorming to crowds of 1,000 people, McAuliffe made his spit pitch to sparsely attended rallies, according to the New York Times. I expect Yunkin to emerge the winner early on Tuesday evening. The question then becomes, what do congressional Democrats do in response? President Biden is fixated on spending massive amounts of federal money, despite his plunging favorability ratings. Will Democrats in Congress study a Yunkin win and respond, hmm, let's change course. The rest of my column, if you want to read it, is over at the Washington Post on the landing page on the right-hand column. My answer is no. They will change a thing, just like in 2010 when Scott Brown beat Martha Coakley to fill the seat left vacant by the death of Senator Ted Kennedy, and it became 59 Republican, uh, 41 Republicans to 59 Democrats. Democrats did not stop for a moment in ruining American health care for millions. 
They put the pedal to the metal and drove Obamacare through, just like these Democrats will push through lots more to trillions of dollars of wasteful spending. We will have more inflation, and come November of 2022, they will get wiped out, like Democrats did in November of 2010. They will lose 63 seats, like they did in November 2010, because they will ignore Glenn Youngkin's win in Virginia. But first, let's get through that win, run through the tape. If you haven't got enough to go and vote, get up and go vote. Call your friends, call your family. Turn around and head home. If you started home and you forgot to go by the library or the school, go and vote. Polls are open in Virginia. They'll be open until 7 o'clock tonight. I'm Hugh Hewitt. This is Carol Platt-Lebow for townhall.com. 30 years have passed since Justice Clarence Thomas was confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. His tenure there has been consequential indeed. He's the court's foremost proponent of natural law, an understanding that our individual rights are transcendent and come from God. This understanding undergirds his approach to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, powerfully informing the justice's unyielding commitment to limited government and equal justice before the law. Over the last five years, Justice Thomas has authored more opinions than any of his colleagues on the Supreme Court. His influence only continues to grow. And he's beloved by the scores of people who know him. He knows the names of the children of the marshals who guard the courthouse. He's mentored generations of clerks, treating them like family. And his distinctive hearty laugh rings out within his judicial chambers. May God bless this great, good, and brilliant man. And may he serve on the court many years longer. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. Not translate into the ability to spread it. And that's an inference. What we know about the empirical studies looking at uh, infected children versus infected adults and spread within their families, within their home dwelling units, is that children are very, very infrequently the, the cause of spread to other family members. It's almost always the adults spread to children, not the other way around. So we know from empirical uh, studies that children don't spread the infection. And that being the case, there's little rationale for putting, uh, you know, masking children where we don't know that the, benefit, that the mask has a preachable benefit on top of the fact that the children don't really spread the infection very much. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. And by the way, have you contracted the coronavirus? Have you had it? I have. I had it about a year ago. Well, did you make the argument that the immunity is stronger than the vaccine? Uh, not in my religious exemptions uh, interview. I did not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that argument's essentially removed. It's not on the table. We, we right. tried to negotiate that at the beginning um, with our association, and it just wasn't an argument the city was having because they were saying we're tied to the mandate, and the mandate doesn't allow for that. Amazing. I, I, I played the other day an, an undercover video by an um, organization called Project Veritas, uh, and they recorded three scientists with Pfizer all admitting that contracting the coronavirus and surviving it gives you stronger immunity than the vaccine, all admitting it. And a couple of them admitted that they can't say it publicly. They signed non-disclosure agreements. And if they ever said anything about this, uh, they'd be in real deep, deep, deep trouble. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Streaming on Salem Now. This is a story of how a million children were placed with local foster families through an unlikely alliance between the Chinese government and a British footballer. Parents from all walks of life share their stories of overcoming the one-child policy by taking in orphans. With unprecedented access across the country, this is a unique insight into the lives of the 90s orphans now driving the 21st century's fastest growing economy. This story needs to be told across the world. At a time where there's so much negativity and cynicism, here's proof that a single leap of faith can change the world. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. 
Ilhan Omar is back at it again. You know, she's been kind of quiet lately. She told her constituents Saturday at a town hall meeting that the rise in gun violence in Minneapolis and the increase in carjackings is due to the police. They have chosen, she said, not to fulfill their oath of office and provide the public safety they owe to the citizens. Now, this is rich. Come on YouTube and at rumble.com. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt, time for climate news. That is my climate conference music. Whenever the climate is in the front line, we get this REM up. I love... I love listening to REM. It's the end of the world as we know it. Global leaders to sign pledge to halt deforestation today in Glasgow. More than 100 global leaders will make a commitment on Tuesday to halt deforestation by 2030. With 30 financial institutions set to promise to eliminate the harmful practice from their portfolios by 2025. You know what I love about this? This is the kind of pledge that everyone loves because nobody has to implement it. Nobody has any law authority at the gathering. If you get this bill through the United States Congress, obliging financial institutions doing business in the United States to stop lending to deforesting entities, that'll work. When you get through the UK Parliament or anything like that, that'll work. This means nothing. Nothing. Wheelchair using minister for climate from Israel was denied entrance to the COP26 yesterday because it wasn't accessible to wheelchairs. So Prime Minister Naftali Bennett uh, arranged a meeting with Prime Minister Boris Johnson today and his energy minister Kareen el Harar will be able to come. It will be held in a wheelchair accessible place. Having uh, spent a few years with my mother-in-law who was in a wheelchair, I actually believe, I can't, I actually can't believe they organized a conference on a world stage without a wheelchair entrance. I mean, I've been to Edinburgh Castle. That's wheelchair accessible. The Queen tells COP26, rise above politics for the sake of our children. Would you all rise? It is time to hear from the Queen. Cut number 17. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference. And it is perhaps fitting that you have come together in Glasgow, once a heartland of the Industrial Revolution, but now a place to address climate change. This is a duty I'm especially happy to discharge, as the impact of the environment on human progress was a subject close to the heart of my dear late husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. I remember well that in 1969, he told an academic gathering, if the world pollution situation is not critical at the moment, it is as certain as anything can be that the situation will become increasingly intolerable within a very short time. Queen, if we that's fail enough of the Queen. With this She's a great lady. All the other um, problems. A we'll good message, and we miss the Duke as well. Uh, other foreign news, decade-long communist rebel leader killed in the Philippines. Ka Oris, otherwise really named Jorge Matos, ambushed and killed finally. He's been leading an insurgency that's killed hundreds, if not thousands, of people in the very south of the Philippines. Good. Australia rolls back travel restrictions for citizens and permanent residents after more than 18 months. Good. The Canadian health expert who claimed to be Morning Star Bear steps aside after her indigenous ancestry question. Why do people do that? Why do people do that? And let me check the market. Brought to you by Birch Gold. You need to buy some gold because inflation worries you. Gold is at 1792 this morning after a day that saw 
The Dow go up 94 and the NASDAQ go up 97 and the S&P go up 5. Now, Brian Westbury told us all two weeks ago in Atlanta that stocks are good for 10 to 12 months. There is an inflationary pressure. The Fed has printed 30% more money than existed. There aren't that many more stocks. There aren't that many new offerings. That money goes into stock prices. They will rise across the board. You might pick a loser. You might be able to pick a loser from this. That's why I just use portfolios and via mutual funds and, and Amazon. But if you need to buy some gold, go to HughGold.com. HughGold.com. Or text my name, Hugh, H-U-G-H, to 474747. Birch Gold will handle the rollover of your IRA or 401k into a physical metals actual depository. Or you can just buy gold. But first, you've got to go to HughGold.com or text Hugh, H-U-G-H, to 474747. Back with more news of the morning next on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. Facebook did two things basically in the 2020 election, one of which we've known about for a while. They basically censored information that was negative about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. They promoted information that was negative about Donald Trump. And I really believe uh, that swung the election in a really important way. But I think more profoundly, I think that Zuckerberg, what we're learning is that he put $420 million dollars to buy up local boards of elections. He did it in an extremely partisan way. And I think it basically rigged the election. I mean, I, you know, all of us are, are, are sort of scratching our heads wondering what really went on in 2020. And I think a big piece of the puzzle is understanding that it was not the people's representatives that were counting ballots, that were canvassing elections. It was partisan hacks that were installed by one of the most powerful people in our country. So have we seen enough of a response to that, a requisite pushback in the last 10 months? Are we going to see it just happen next next year? Will it be a billion dollars, J.D.? You know, I, I don't think there will be a billion dollars. But but look, this is this is where humans have the ability to push back against this stuff. Right. You know, we're, we're, we need to be men of action in this moment. And Americans need to say, look, no more of this. We need to actually ban Zuckerberg money coming in and buying up Democratic votes in our elections, or we're not, never going to have a free and fair election in this country ever again. People are woken up to it, so I think there's going to be a little bit more hesitancy from people like Zuckerberg to go in and buy the election. But when they try to do it, and they will, Seb, we need to be ready to push back. We yeah. need to be filing lawsuits. We need to be you know, getting up and protesting. We need to be aware of what's going on. And I think we're, again, I'm optimistic because we are at least aware of what happened now. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe today at rumble.com. Streaming on Salem Now. Seminary. Madre, padre, ¿quién está listo para ser transformado por el poder de su palabra? Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Schools are lining up to push the transgender agenda on kids and cut parents out of the equation. Go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. Where they just get to march right into America because they feel as if they deserve it. Now you watch videos of this, they're not stopping. They call this the mother of all caravans is what is being built right now in Mexico. And that does not count all the other millions and millions of people that have crossed illegally into America. Can we get an exact number on that, Connor, of the millions of people that have crossed into America? 1.7 million that have already crossed into the interior of our country. 1.7 million people. 
to give an idea of how many people that is, that's more people than the entire state of Idaho. Idaho's like 1.8 million people, so it's about one state of Idaho so far this year. We're here in Idaho right now. Whole state of Idaho illegally entering into America. So I have a couple questions. Who is funding this caravan? Republican attorney generals in red states, they need to start to investigate the money flows because the Department of Justice is too busy going after moms and dads at school board meetings and using the Patriot Act against them. Republican attorney generals need to start to open up investigations saying, who's funding these caravans? Who's funding the ability for people to illegally enter into our country, a crime? That is a criminal enterprise that no one cares about. No one even wants to talk about. But this cuts at the very core of what it means to be a citizen in the American in the American constitutional system, where if you feel as if that the lawful are penalized to an unfair extent, and if you just get to come from Nicaragua, you get to just walk into the country, no questions asked. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway on this election day in Virginia and New Jersey and Ohio. Get out and vote in the 15th Congressional and, and everywhere that you are. Go to your school board election if one is local and just vote for the outsiders. Just vote for the outsiders. It is time for America to put its foot down. Schools are about reading or writing and higher math skills. They're not about wokeness. They're not about diversity. They are not about CRT. They are about preparing children to flourish in this world, all children, regardless of race and religion. Public schools worked wonderfully well in the 50s, the 60s, and even into the 70s. Then they began their long hurtling downhill. Republicans have taken it up as an issue occasionally and then put it back down. Glenn Youngkin has made educational success the centerpiece of his Virginia gubernatorial campaign. After Terry McAuliffe said this in the second debate, cut number one. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. Then Glenn Youngkin really began to rise in the polls. He was already uh, within striking distance of Terry McAuliffe. But when Terry McAuliffe revealed his real agenda, which is politicizing schools, his numbers plummeted through the floor, including yesterday's absurd charge, cut number five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have. I, I, I think Terry's call to get rid of the white teacher is simply going to hurt his turnout the vote effort. Did you know that teachers in most districts in Virginia have today off and they had yesterday off on, quote, Teacher's Day? Uh, that's actually negotiated by collective bargaining unions interested in making their militant members, who are also their bargaining unit members, available for working the polls and being volunteers, which is fine. i got nothing against that. There are going to be volunteers all over the place. The very well-regulated election in Virginia today, the early vote was well-regulated. The early vote went over a million. It's about 200,000 four years ago. We will see what that spells. Yesterday at the Supreme Court, there was an argument. It really wasn't about abortion, though the law before the justices concerns abortion. The Texas statute passed this year that allows private citizens to sue anyone participating in an abortion of a, an unborn child with a heartbeat. And it leaves enforcement up to private individuals. So there is no government involved. The government's not going after the abortion provider 
or the abortion doctor, they're going after um, uh, them via private lawsuits. So individual citizens can go and say this is an illegally operating, it's called citizen standing. And it exists, by the way, in things like endangered species, world, etc. So citizen standing and no government action calls into question whether or not there's anything to sue over. Uh, the Chief Justice yesterday confronted Mark Heron of the Center for Reproductive Rights about this question. Cut 19. Is the well, counsel, it, the matters that you're talking about now, it, they're essential to your argument, right? You, you agree that it would be adequate to have federal court review at the end of the state process, but for uh, the chilling effect that you're talking about, right? I, I think not in the way that SB8 is structured. I, I mean, if there is um, review from this court holding that the law is unconstitutional, that would be adequate. But I think that th there are a number review of reasons. At the end, the review at the end of the day, right, when we have a final judgment from the state judiciary. But there are a number of reasons that that is unlikely to happen. Um, first of all, if, if you win in the trial court, if the uh, state trial court says that the law is unconstitutional, then getting broader relief depends on your opponents appealing that to the intermediate court, through the Texas Supreme Court, and that the, the proponents of this law are acting very strategically. Well, that's true in any case, right? I mean, if you get relief in the trial court and your opponent doesn't appeal, there's no real reason for you to seek relief in the Supreme Court, is there? But in the normal case, if you win that case, if you, if you win, then you don't have to continue litigating that. Here, SB 8 says there is no preclusive effect. I know you're getting back to the argument that there is a chilling effect. I'm asking yes. for your position in the absence of that. If it's just a regular type of case, surely it's adequate to have federal review at the end of the state court process. In the normal case, yes, you are, that is correct. I agree with that. That, um, you know, in a normal tort lawsuit, that is adequate. It is the chilling effect that is, that in this case is created by the combination of delegation of, of enforcement of a public policy to the uh, general public at large and um, there's no preclusive effect, and, the, and all of the special rules that are created in order to turn the Texas state courts into a tool that can be used to nullify Counsel. the extra. Then Justice Amy Coney Barrett jumps in, also questioning Mark Heron about the law. Cut 20. Even apart from these procedural uh, requirements that you're talking about, I'm wondering if in a defensive posture in state court, the constitutional defense can be fully aired. And I'm wondering that for this reason. The statute says that a defendant may not establish an undue burden, and this is even assuming that the defendant can satisfy third-party standing rules because the statute says it has to be Craig versus Boren, not the regular abortion um, third-party standing rules. But it says that a defendant may not establish an undue burden under this section by, and this is D2 in this section, arguing or attempting to demonstrate that an award of relief against other defendants or other potential defendants will impose an undue burden on women seeking an abortion. So I take that to mean that a defendant can only say an award against me would place a substantial obstacle. And that's not the full constitutional holding of either Whole Women's Health or June Medical. It's looking at the law as a whole and its deterrent effect. Do you read that the same way? I, I completely agree, Your Honor. Yeah. So if that's the case, the full constitutional defense cannot be uh, asserted in the defensive posture. Am I right? I, I think that's right, Your Honor. That the, and, the, and the title of that section that you're, that you're referencing is called Limitations on Undue Burden Defense. Clearly, it's not only the procedural rules that t the Texas legislature has tried to change the substantive rules that this court um, applies uh, to protect the... the so does that mean you cannot get full review even on the back end if it goes up through the Texas Supreme Court and up to us the way the statute is structured? We, we would have an argument, Your Honor, and, and we would obviously make the argument that that provision of the Texas law is, is unconstitutional because it conflicts with this court's precedents um, in, in Casey, but... Um, but, Your Honor, it's unclear exactly how the Texas um, courts would apply that, whether they would follow the undue burden standard. And clearly what the legislature was trying to do was to, to limit the... Yeah, you know, what I want you to hear is Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Barrett, understanding fully what plaintiff's argument is, and they may in fact be sympathetic. You can never guess. A question is intended to tease out questions for the nine when they sit down in the conference room off the Chief Justice's office. And, and I believe that 
uh, this is not a case about abortion. This is a case about civil procedure, and it's a case about federalism, and it's a case about the right of a state to institute a law to evade federal review uh, and whether or not that will fly. And they need five justices to strike it down. Here's what I want people to understand. Whether it is enjoined or struck down, whether it is not enjoined, it's not the main event. The main event, I believe, is scheduled for December 1 or 2 in the Supreme Court. It's the arguments in Dobbins, the attempt to uh, overturn the Mississippi law that limits abortion to prior to 15 work, weeks of pregnancy. Their row and Planned Parenthood v. Casey are front and center. And the court will, I believe, overturn those precedents and bring to an end 50 years of incoherence, uh, gyration, jerry-rigged uh, jurisprudence. I think that all happens in December with a, with a decision coming down in June of next year. But that this is simply a demonstration of the mental capacity, the, le the legal chops of that court, which are extraordinary. This is the smartest court that we've had in my lifetime and they are going to produce great decisions. This might be a civil procedure decision. It's not an abortion case decision. That's what I wanted you to hear. It's not about abortion. That will be Dobbins. And this is about civil procedure and evading federal review in the federal courts. Now I want to turn to the meltdown among the Democrats yesterday. Senator Joe Manchin may have gotten a peek at the internals in Virginia, which show Glenn Youngkin running away with it. Terry McAuliffe defeated in disarray, Democrats uh, just completely demoralized and disgusted with Democrats generally for spending all the money and not delivering anything. So Joe Manchin held a presser yesterday, cut number 12. I've heard a lot of the mischaracterizations of my position since the president met with the House Democrats last Thursday, and I would like to make an attempt to clear up any confusion about where I stand on the legislation that's working its way through Congress. In all of my years of public service, and I've been around for a long time, I've never seen anything like this. The President of the United States has addressed the House Democratic Caucus twice recently to urge action on the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which sometimes we refer to as the BIF bill. Last week, the Speaker urged, Speaker Pelosi urged the importance of voting and passing the BIF bill before the President took the world stage overseas and still no action. In my view, this is not how the United States Congress should operate or, in my view, has operated in the past. The political games have to stop. Twice now, the House has balked at the opportunity to send the BIF legislation to the President. As you've heard, there are some House Democrats who say they can't support this infrastructure package until they get my commitment on the reconciliation legislation. It is time to vote on the BIF bill, up or down. And then go home and explain to your constituents the decision you made. And I've always said, if I can't go home and explain it, I can't vote for it. And if I can, I, I will. I've worked in good faith for three months, for the past three months, with President Biden, Leader Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, and my colleagues on the reconciliation bill. And I will continue to do so. For the sake of the country, I urge the House to vote and pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Holding this bill hostage is not going to work in getting my support for a recon reconciliation bill. Throughout the last three months, I've been straightforward about my con concerns that I will not support a reconciliation package that expands social programs and irresponsibly adds to our $29 trillion in national debt that no one seems to really care about or even talk about. Nor will I support a package that risks hurting American families suffering from historic inflation. Simply put, I will not support a bill that is this consequential without thoroughly understanding the impact that it'll have on our national debt, our economy, and most importantly, all of our American people. Every Now, Joe Manchin is basically saying, stuff it, House Democrats. Now, I want to explain this for the Steelers fans. West Virginia is west of Virginia, but it has a border. So West Virginia is next to Virginia Steelers fans. So Joe Manchin is looking at what's going on in Virginia with Glenn Youngkin soaring over the hoop and saying, I'm probably in trouble if I support this lunacy from Bernie Sanders, the squad, and the Progressive Alliance, and I'm not going to. Because he studied, you get, just understand, Virginia is next to West Virginia. And so he's studying 
Western Virginia so that in West Virginia the same thing doesn't happen to him that's happening to Terry McCollum. Relieffactor.com. I want to explain this for the Steelers fan. This is a package of, I'm very bitter about the Steelers fans today. This is, and you Carl especially, this is Icarian and Curcumin, Resveratrol and Omega. That's four different pills. See, they're in my hand. And the reason I take it every day at this hour with my lukewarm coffee, every car, after the show, I go out trundling. That's when I work off my frustration with callers and with Dwayne, who doesn't do anything I ask him to do, and, and, and Ben and Adam, who Ben's in there talking about the, the Golden State Warriors when the Cavs won their fourth game, taking a three out of five road game. ReliefFactor.com. We need to send it to the Charlotte Hornets because they got bested by the Cavs last night. ReliefFactor.com. 1995. Get you started. Come right back. now on the Charlie Kirk Show. Justice is giving to every single man what is their due. There is a yearning for justice in the soul of humanity. And when a regular normal American earning $55,000 a year, a police officer, a teacher, a firefighter, turns on TV or they find out that thousands of people are just wanting to waltz into the country, they start to feel as if that's not fair. It doesn't, you don't need an over explanation for this. The caravan and the subsequent illegal invasion of our country cuts at the core of American justice. A seven year old can see what's happening on the southern border and can say, there's something not right about that. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. He used social media, and they said that they would do whatever it took to make sure that he wasn't able to communicate directly with the people in an unfiltered fashion. And so they said about everything from deplatforming effective conservative voices, censoring the president and other people, creating algorithmic uh, chaos where if you search for information, it would devalue information from right-leaning sources and elevate those on the left. Um, you know, massive amounts of deplatforming and marginalizing of conservative voices to the tune. Of, I mean, this this actually probably had more effect than anything, including propaganda media's malfeasance, malfeasance in the election. But it's a uh, it, they just they exerted massive control, and you know, to think that it still came within 43,000 votes in three states, even after all they did, is it tells you just how much they did. I think. So, I'm putting you on the spot here. The president, the former president, President Trump's continued statement that the election was, quote, stolen. A, is it a word you would use? B, do you think he should use it? I don't try to give him advice, but no. I mean, I love the word rigged, which is why I named the book Rigged. Before votes even happened, everything was designed to orchestrate a particular outcome, whether that was fake news or censorship tech control of everything, changing election laws, uh, funding of elections. I think sometimes people just get a little bit too much into the semantics, like call it what you want. We just need to know what happened and whether it should be allowed to happen. But I really like the word rigged. Which is why I named the book that. Yes, it makes sense. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Tesla was a genius. His most amazing discoveries thought to be written in a lost journal. Now in the right hands, it could revolutionize the 21st. Welcome back, America. I think you all know that I'm Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway and that all of America is focused on one thing, 
The college football playoff rankings come out tonight. It will be Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, and Cincinnati. But David Drucker is probably paying attention to the Virginia gubernatorial election and maybe New Jersey. Good morning, David. How are you? I'm great, Hugh. How are you? Good. In Trump's shadow in bookstores everywhere, you're doing well. I see it's doing well at Amazon, doing well everywhere. Does interest continue in the book? It does. And the great thing about In Trump's shadow is that it's one of those books, as it turns out, which I didn't quite think about in these terms, the uh, further I get away from the published date, the closer I get to what the entire story is about, which is the future of the Republican Party and the impact Trump has had on the party, because we keep getting closer and closer by the day to 2024, and we keep getting into that future. So, um, so many great books about Trump's presidency, but every day we get a little further away from that and a little closer to where my book tries to sort of lay out a roadmap. So I'm pleased with the reaction in Trump's shadow, and I'm continuing to talk about it. I've learned, you, you, you probably know this, but talking about in Trump's shadow is a lot more fun than writing in Trump's shadow. Writing 100%. Fair, talking about it is great. Yeah. So in Trump's shadow in bookstores everywhere, the former president made a conference call to Virginia supporters last night uh, as Glenn Youngkin was crisscrossing the state, ending in Loudoun County late to a crowd of thousands. Uh, president Trump has not visited the state, and Glenn Youngkin has generally avoided talking about Donald Trump because he wants to talk about Virginia schools. It looks like it's working, David Drucker. What do you assess Virginia as this morning? It really does. I mean, look, I, I rate the race a toss-up, but when you, you're in a Biden plus 10 state, uh, just one year ago, in a state that hasn't elected a Republican to the governor's mansion since 2009, uh, Glenn Youngkin is just in a really good position. I think he's in a good position because, uh, for the most part, he's focused on the most important issue to Virginia voters about Virginia in this race. And Terry McAuliffe tried to make fetch happen by turning Ter uh, Glenn Youngkin into Donald Trump. And by the way, I think that strategy probably would have been just fine if President Trump had won re-election and was in the White House. But he's not. And then, of course, you know, on top of it, just Joe Biden, the president, isn't doing well. His approval numbers are down. But, I, you know, we may be able to look back at this depending on the outcome, let's say, if Youngkin wins and say, well, there's really nothing Terry McAuliffe could have done given the president's low approval ratings and, and the drag uh, from Capitol Hill where the Democratic Congress can't get its, you know, act together with legislation, but the strategy not to focus on the biggest concern about which, as governor, he has po the power to try and do something about, and rather turn Youngkin into Trump, it, it just it just wasn't a good strategy. And no, because he's entitled. Over, yeah. yeah. He, Terry and feels entitled to be governor, yeah. and it's not going to work. And because you, you avert to cut number one. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. That is the trap door which he pulled on himself, David Drucker. Well, he did, but you have to credit Youngkin and his campaign with, with and I don't mean it this way, I was going to say, but with seizing on it, it's yeah. recognizing pounced. the error. Yeah. <laughs> they pounce, they seize. Uh, Pouncy the seizing cat, I like to say. They recognize that it was a problem, and they focused on it, and they wouldn't let go of it. You know, some campaigns are given such opportunities, and they don't do that. They continue talking about whatever it is they want to talk about, or they get, you know, they get distracted by their opponent making accusations about this, that, the other. I mean, they just drilled on this and drilled on it. And even when McAuliffe, you know, put out a TV ad saying he was taken out of context, then they took that ad and yep. made their own ad saying he wasn't. And it just, it's just been a very strategically run campaign. Youngkin, for a first-time candidate, has been very disciplined. He's recognized the opportunity he has to run for governor and not for the U.S. Senate or anything else. And he's kept th that campaign all about, all about that. And look, and I think, you know, for Democrats, and look, both parties get caught up in fighting the last war until it, they finally realize it doesn't work anymore. You know, they wouldn't let go of a, a strategy that worked in 2018, worked, frankly, in 2017, but without Trump in the White House, when you're running everything in Washington, you, you know, you can't, usually you don't win by demonizing the other side because the other side, even if they were once scary, are a lot less scary to skeptical voters when they're not in power anymore. And you don't win by stepping on the rake 
Again, again, here is Terry last night, <laughs> cut number five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 50 of the students in Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. So let's divert. Uh, David Drucker, what do we have to do in a school to make everybody? Do we have to fire the white teachers? Because that's what it sounds like Terry McAuliffe stepping on another rake, rake last night is advocating. Right. So look, you could look at this and say that he's trying to motivate uh, non-white voters to show up and vote for him. But again, he's talking to a problem that a lot of Virginia voters have not insane is a problem versus the problem they say they have and that's in his problem hunter uh, david drucker exactly on point as is in trump's shadow david drucker's new book available in bookstores now at amazon.com come back for our number two thank you david i will be talking with glenn Youngkin, who i think is going to be the next governor of virginia my washington post column on that race is now at the landing page at washingtonpost.com i'm hugh hewitt come back Tesla was a genius. His most amazing discoveries thought to be written in a lost journal. Now in the right hands, it could revolutionize the 21st century, but in the wrong hands. Kill him. Kill him. If you can stop an earthquake, doesn't that mean you could start one too? That's why that notebook should never fall into the wrong hands. There's an old brown battered notebook in my office at work. You have to find it, take it, and keep it hidden at all costs. The, uh, the G20 leaders meeting downtown, they're in danger. In fact, the, the whole of downtown could be in danger. If we are to build a superhuman, we must first eliminate those who are flawed. People are created equally. All of downtown, the high-rises were built on rollers to withstand horizontal shakes. A vertical quake this size could collapse half of downtown. We have commenced the countdown. Shall we stop this thing? Save, Save the universe! universe. The um, referees, however, has voted for in favor of a vaccine mandate, but the players have not. And Kyrie Irving is refusing to get vaccinated. New York City is one of, I think, two cities that is requiring uh, proof of having been vaccinated in order to play. Here's what he said again. You know, I know I can use my platform to, to spread positivity and, and spread light on the things that matter to me, you know, and um, I just care about our world a lot. And if I'm going to be demonized for that, um, at least let me go out on my own accord. You know, first things first, uh, this isn't about me and it's not about me dispelling, uh, you know, what's being said about me particularly or for anybody. It's just saying, you know, I'm standing with all those that, uh, you know, believe in what's right and are doing what's right for themselves. You know, everybody has a personal choice with their lives. Um, you know, everybody has a right to feel a certain type of way. Everybody's entitled to their own opinions. Everybody's entitled to, to do what they feel is best for themselves, you know, and, and putting me as a hero or painting me as a villain, sort of say, or going against the vaccine mandates. Like, that wasn't, that wasn't my intent at all. And to be sitting in this seat here and seeing, you know, the way that this is dividing our world up, you know, being vaccinated or being unvaccinated, uh, you know, it's just sad to see. Uh, it's, it's creating a lot of division, a lot of confusion, you know, a lot of people saying things that are untrue. Um, we're not giving space for each other to speak. You know, you got doctors out here working hard, physicians out here working hard, and um, everybody's trying to do what's best for them and their families, which I respect. And I'm always going to put that first. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Thank you.
trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. And, you know, I, I got to share with you a little behind the scenes conflict we just had. My producer, of course, is very diligent about dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's. And today I'm going to have a conversation with Molly Hemingway, who wrote a book called Rigged. She wrote a book detailing the ways that Mark Zuckerberg funded communities that Biden desperately needed. Molly Hemingway is a constant, consistent voice questioning the integrity of the November 2020 election. They'll try to silence that. They'll censor that. They'll shut it down. That's where we are. If you dare question the integrity of the election, they try to cancel you. They censor that view. You're not allowed to do it. You may not do it. But why do Democrats get to do it? Why does Terry McAuliffe get to do it? Why does Stacey Abrams get to do it? Why does Nancy Pelosi get to do it? Why does Hillary Clinton get to do it? Why do Democrats... We know the answer. Because they're, 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 they're fraudulent. These are liars. With zero consistency... And now the chickens are coming home to, the, to roost. People are, are, are marching in the streets and peacefully objecting to mandates, to firing people. And yes, over election integrity. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Streaming on Salem Now. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. <laughs> and the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. This is what third world security states do. They spy on their political opponents like this. This is part of a concerted uh, Russian influence operation. Russians, I'm not going to be specific as He knew he could just say it on TV and then hide behind, well, it's all classified, I can't get into it. It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. It's given people who are bad faith actors a license to do whatever they want. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. How bullied are you that Americans are finally waking up, J.D.? Look, I'm very excited about what I'm seeing, you know, certainly in Virginia, but also in Ohio. Uh, it feels like there's a real grassroots movement brewing on the conservative movement right now. And it's, you know, j- just like in, in times past, it's not just the politicos. It's not just the establishment folks. Sometimes not even people who are that political, but they're just very fired up about what their kids are teaching. You know, their 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 kids are coming home crying, upset because they're being told that they're a, you know, a bad person depending on the color of their skin, and they're just fed up about it. And I think it, you know, it may very well take down Terry McAuliffe, but I certainly think it is the beginning of a movement all across this country. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. now on the Charlie Kirk show justice is something a country must at least attempt to get right you're going to have things side wants to give them amnesty wants to make them citizens this is not sustainable we know it's not sustainable and the ruling class in both parties by the way the Republican party and the Democrat party They want this for votes. They want this for government dependency. They want this for cheap labor. Now, I'm pleased to see that Texas is now stepping up and saying, we're not going to put up with this. Texas needs to defy federal authority, arrest every single person that comes from this caravan. They need to be welcoming this caravan, not with benefits and signs, but with handcuffs and chartered flights back to right where they came from immediately. No questions asked. Don't put them in front of the judge. Put them on a plane and get them back. They broke the law. That would be justice. A seven-year-old would say, yeah, they deserve to go back.
because they broke our laws. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Morning, glory, America, bonjour, hi, Canada, I'm Hugh Hewitt, inside the Beltway on Election Day. It's Election Day in New Jersey, Election Day in Virginia, Election Day in Ohio. Hey, you folks in Loveland, Ohio, don't forget to vote for my friend and law school roommate Tim Butler up for re-election in Loveland. Nothing like a nationally syndicated radio host to tell you, Loveland voters, go vote for Tim Butler. I am joined by Byron York of the Washington Examiner and also Fox News. Good morning, Byron. How are you? Good morning, Hugh. Doing well, thank you. I, I have to play for you. A, a floundering Terry McAuliffe last night. Last night in Virginia, cut number five. I'd like you to translate this for us, Byron, when you hear it. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. So let's diversify. So here's what I'm going to do. We'll be the first all right, state in America. All right, Byron do... York, what did he just say? Didn't he just say we're going to have to fire a bunch of white teachers and hire a bunch of teachers of color? Sounded like that to me. I think it, he clearly said that Virginia has to reduce the number of white teachers in its public school system. I think there's no doubt about what he just said. And And to me... Well, I, I read this a lot of ways. One, he has great trouble motivating the African-American reliable vote. They don't like him. Uh, he beat Princess Blanding in the primary. I believe she's on the ballot. I believe a lot of uh, black progressives will go and vote for her. But number two, his teacher unions have negotiated a day off in many districts across Virginia. Do you think they're going to be enthusiastic about voting for him if they hear that? <laughs> no. And listen, th this campaign is ending on such a down and negative note for Terry McAuliffe that it's hard not to conclude that he's kind of expecting uh, to lose. And and this is so obvious to everybody. I mean, did you see Politico's account of, uh, of the, their two rallies last night? No. Um, no. Was it, was it horrible again? Well... Uh, it starts off, Terry McAuliffe wanted Glenn Youngkin and Donald Trump to campaign together so badly that when it didn't happen, McAuliffe simply invented a Youngkin-Trump event that didn't exist. Quote, <laughs> guess how Glenn Youngkin is finishing his campaign? McAuliffe told a modest crowd outside of Fairfax Brewery Monday, he's doing an event with Donald Trump here in Virginia. This is Politico talking. That was a lie. <laughs> Trump, well, there you go. Trump wasn't in Virginia he never campaigned with Youngkin, always, though he made the case for Youngkin during a brief tele-rally, which lasted six minutes, by the way. Th 30 miles away at the Loudoun County Fairgrounds, a crowd several times the size of McAuliffe's was waiting for Youngkin to take the stage. You got a hint of why McAuliffe was desperate to manufacture the fake Trump event. Okay, now the, 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 the coverage has turned oh, you uh, bet. against him. And so the, the two touchstones of, of fighting um, Youngkin have been to tie him to Trump and to accuse him of racism. And we've just covered both of them uh, oh. in this conversation. Yeah, Byron, I love when the legacy media that has been telling us Terry McAuliffe has been a lock for months, then they realize he's getting smoked. Then they all begin to pass by the, his coffin in the ground, political coffin, and throw a little dirt on it, right? They don't, they don't actually pronounce him dead. They all just come by and throw a handful of dirt, you know, like an old uh, crime family show. And Terry is saying, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> I'm not dead. He's, you know, he's got a line from Monty Python. So when we go back at this, I also want to pay homage to Glenn Youngkin and his team. He's run a flawless campaign, disciplined, energetic message uh, that I began, I think began when the State Board of Education banished accelerated math before the 11th grade, even before Glenn Youngkin was nominated, he jumped on that. Uh, he has run, a, uh, as far as I can tell, 
a flawless campaign. And uh, by the way, if you look at what he was talking about last night, uh, he was talking about jobs. He was talking about the DMV. Of course, the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, is a huge event, a huge issue in any state. Uh, the grocery tax, uh, he talked about George W. Bush. He's, he's creating, it seems to me, a post-Trump campaign in a uh, state that what, what went for Biden by 10 points, 12 points last time, uh, in, in, a, in a blue or purple state. Uh, this is something that Republicans are going to have to figure out how to do across the country, and this is what Youngkin has done. Now, let me ask you something, Byron. I also think long COVID political is a subcategory of political phenomenon, and it's long mm-hmm. COVID effects. And I believe in Virginia, people are really angry about what the schools did last year and about their return rules this year and their quarantine rules this year. I know that for a fact because I have three young grandchildren, two of whom are young elementary school students, and my mill spouse daughter cannot figure out the rules and can't get a straight answer from anyone. And she is not political, but she is angry at official Virginia education policy about kids with COVID or exposed to COVID. I can't imagine she's alone. No, and, and, this, and this is just all negative uh, against the schools and against somebody like McAuliffe who was advocating this. If you look at the last Washington Post poll um, of this race, which had McAuliffe very slightly ahead, uh, it did ask, what are the most important issues to you? And the most important issue was the economy. It was not COVID. I think that was an important poll that shows that many, many people in Virginia have taken the rather sensible advice of get your vaccine and live your life. And uh, when the schools don't do that, when the schools uh, come up with all of these restrictions and continue to to act as if it's 2020, and so many people know that unionized teachers just don't seem to want to to have uh, to teach in person, uh, it really hurts Jerry McAuliffe. You know, uh, teaching fatigue is a real deal. I've been teaching con law for 25 years, but I took a year and a half off because you got to get energized again after 25 years. So I know a lot of the older teachers that are looking for their 30 and out are just, they're done with new technology. They don't want to do it. They're out of, they're out of energy, but that doesn't do anything for the moms of Virginia. And Glenn Youngkin's been talking up charter schools a lot, Byron York. I think it's a playbook for every Republican. Absolutely. I mean, uh, education, look, it, uh, who was the president? He did talk about a former Republican president quite a bit last night, and he talked about George W. Bush. So he wanted to um, connect with the sort of education president um, reputation of George W. Bush, who, you know, before September 11th got elected, uh, promising to be the education president. Events had different you know, plans in mind for Bush and for the country. But uh, it is an effective, it's one of the most effective issues you have. And, and I think when everybody looks over this race, uh, people will say that moment that Terry McAuliffe um, said that he did not believe parents should be teaching or should be telling schools, you know, what to teach. Um, I think that's going to be a key moment in McAuliffe's defeat. Let's play that again. Cut one. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. Play it again, please. I don't Cut think one. parents should be telling schools what they should teach. <laughs> one more time. I don't think for the parents Steelers should fan. be telling schools what they should teach. <laughs> I think I played it uh, a couple of hundred times, Byron, because to me it is a summation of the left's proposition concerning children and parents in schools. I really do believe it's the the gaffe, as Michael Kinsley said, is when you tell the truth, but you're yeah. not supposed to. Yeah, the arrogance was really astonishing, and everybody got that. And the message was, don't question us. The message to, to, to parents was, don't question us. Um, and, the, you know, the sophistry involved in saying that, you know, critical race theory uh, has never been taught. It's something that, you know, never got within a thousand miles of Virginia. People understood what was being taught. And... Um, and just it was all encapsulated in this arrogance of 
we are the teachers, we are the government, don't tell us what to do. Very quickly, Byron, the transitive principle also applies. If saying you're concerned about CRT is a racist dog whistle, then those who are concerned about CRT are racist. And they're not. And they're mad at being called racist. Am I right about that? Well, I think, yes. I, I think that that's been something that you've seen uh, all along. And Democrats, look, Democrats are trying to figure out a post-Trump campaign style just like Republicans are. And all they can think of is Trump racism, Trump racism. And when you have a candidate like Youngkin where it just doesn't apply, obviously they've been floundering. Floundering, and I think going down big. I don't think it'll be a late night in Virginia, but get out and vote, Virginia. Get out and vote New Jersey and Ohio. Get out and vote in Loveland, Ohio. Get out and vote for Tim Butler. But Virginia, send a message. Send a very loud message to the Democrats. Stop. Stop it all. We might not have liked Donald Trump, but we don't think we love your lefty insanity. insanity. Get out there and vote, America. I'll be right back on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Streaming on Salem Now. We'll see one young lady identify as transgender, and the next thing you know, six or seven young ladies in that same school are now identifying as transgender. Children taught at age five they can create their gender identity, and it's being celebrated. Schools are lining up to push the transgender agenda on kids and cut parents out of the equation. Every cell of their body that has a nucleus is male or female. We've now seen parents losing custody of their children if they don't go along with this. We've all been created XY or XX, so that means there's only two genders. And so really the battle is against the creator. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. And the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. I grew up poor, which is even worse than being poor. Uh, we would have sandwiches with no meat. My American dream entailed working hard and making $20,000 a year. But I surpassed that goal and became a corporate CEO. We'll all be able to say, free at last, free at last. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Streaming on Salem Now. The public would be outraged if they knew the truth. Why do you think our politicians are not on the sidewalk right now talking to you? I don't have no respect. The old wall randomly turns into a guardrail, followed by miles of open border. Human trafficking. That journey is extremely dangerous. The seven-year-old girl died in the desert. From the country of India. A great pillar of the community was killed by a man who had been deported at least twice. This little urn contains the ashes of my son. His dreams cut short forever. We're so worried about other countries' problems, and we don't even focus on our own. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. The Democratic Party somehow has convinced black people that they're the good guys. Never mind the skanky history of the Democratic Party. That was a party of slavery. There is a whole big uh, cottage industry for racism. If racism went away, a lot of people would be unemployed. The mob during the Minneapolis riots following the death of George Floyd. A bunch of white thugs, frankly, burning down the city's traditional black and Asian business. Business. They're racist, racist, racist. Everything's racist. Look for Salem now in the App Store or go. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. 
And I thought, now listen, if you're if you're going to make that kind of argument that that um, a Donald Trump has to live up to the standards of ancient Israel, theocratic Israel, then how in the world, David French, can you find yourself in um, wanting to see somebody like Joe Biden or one of his favorites, Mitt Romney, and definitely would not fall <laughs> under um, the standards of a king of Israel. Uh, these kinds of things that I've just found to be very dubious arguments, and I have noticed many Christians who have felt very strongly about what French has said, positively or negatively, but those on the negative side who felt like they're ill-equipped um, really to fight back. So I thought, I'll do it for you. Keep up with what's trending. The sun is indeed coming up, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt taking you to work in America. Even those of you on the West Coast, I know you're leaving early for work. Clay, great to have you with me this morning inside the Beltway. As Virginia votes to my south, as New Jersey votes to my north, as Ohio votes to my west. And in Loveland, Ohio, I hope you're out there voting for Tim Butler because it's really the only candidate I know well. I know Glenn Youngkin pretty well now. I've interviewed him about... 20 times. He'll be on the show in a couple of segments to talk about last night. I think he's got to get up in the morning thinking about education, go to bed at night thinking about education, and work on education all day long. Inspire, inform, educate, and change the law. The state senators in Virginia, they'll still be under the Democratic control, but some of them are pretty smart on education. Getting charter schools up and running in Virginia to provide competition in a real way to the public education, educrats, is vital. A new superintendent of education is vital. A new state board of education is vital. New regents for the University of Virginia and William and Mary and George Mason and James Madison and the entire great Virginia uh, state community college and college network is vital. Because it's all mired in CRT nonsense. It's all mired in racism. Knowledge of race, acting on the basis of race is racism. It's prohibited by the 14th Amendment. We've got to get rid of it. Time to check the markets from yesterday, brought to you by andrewandtodd.com. Andrewandtodd.com are the world's best mortgage lenders. There was Sierra Pacific Mortgage, a great sponsor of this program. You can call them at 888 For all your lending needs, if you want to refinance, the 10-year Treasury remains at 1.575, below 1.6. Below 2% is the all-time historic low. It's been a good six months at this level, maybe eight. Ever since COVID hit, the market went crazy. But I have my hand on the Wall Street Journal today. Farewell offshoring, outsourcing, pandemic, rewrites, CEO playbook. Lots of manufacturing, lots of great jobs coming back to the United States over the next five years as CEOs realize you can't count on China. What that means is housing markets are going to go up because CEOs are paying more. They're bringing back their middle managers. They're bringing back their rising executives. They're all going to be scattered all over the United States. You've got to get your home now. You've got to get in now. Become a non-occupying co-borrower with your son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter. Help get into a home. Triple A, triple A, eleven seventy-two. Yesterday, the Dow was up ninety-four points. The Nasdaq was up ninety-seven points, and the S and P was up eight. So, a good day on the markets overseas this morning. It's mixed. Germany and France are up. Great Britain is down. I don't know what's going to happen in today's market. Too early to tell. It's always too early to tell until 4 o'clock Eastern time. But whatever you do, do get your loan for your home and do refinance when the rates are this low from andrewandtodd.com. I want to go back and play that Terry McCall. It's so astonishing what he said last night. Cut number five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50%. 50% of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color. 
and yet 80 percent of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. So let's diversify. So here's what I'm going to do. Okay, wait a minute. Do you know what that means? That is an outcome-based, race-conscious approach to hiring teachers. I don't care if a teacher is polka dot. I don't care if a teacher is a first-year immigrant from the farthest away land in the world that, that has arrived if they have good English and connect with kids. I don't care if you've got all white teachers or all black teachers. I don't care in a classroom. It does not matter. Are they a good or great teacher? I remember when Governor Mitt Romney was running Massachusetts. He called in the Bain Worldwide Group and said, study everything that there is on education. Tell me what is the most important factor. And they did. They did the classic MBA thing. They went away, they studied all the data, they came back and said, nothing matters more than teachers. And teachers matter most by a lot. If you have a great teacher, they will overcome class size, they will overcome poor furnishing, they will overcome lack of investment in the classroom, they'll overcome parents who are distracted, they'll overcome hungry kids. They will make the class work. It's all about great teachers. And you do not hire teachers by race, Terry McAuliffe. What a nightmare you have proposed to Virginia. No wonder you're getting blown out today. Go out and vote for Glenn Youngkin this morning, America. I'll be right back on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of The Hugh Hewitt Show brought to you by Sierra Pacific Mortgage. For more info, call 888-888-1172. million children were placed with local foster families. Parents from all walks of life share their stories of overcoming the one child policy by taking in orphans. Go to SalemNow.com. This is Carol Platt-Lebow for townhall.com. 30 years have passed since Justice Clarence Thomas was confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. His tenure there has been consequential indeed. He's the court's foremost proponent of natural law, an understanding that our individual rights are transcendent and come from God. This understanding undergirds his approach to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, powerfully informing the justice's unyielding commitment to limited government and equal justice before the law. Over the last five years, Justice Thomas has authored more opinions than any of his colleagues on the Supreme Court. His influence only continues to grow. And he's beloved by the scores of people who know him. He knows the names of the children of the marshals who guard the courthouse. He's mentored generations of clerks, treating them like family. And his distinctive hearty laugh rings out within his judicial chambers. May God bless this great, good, and brilliant man. And may he serve on the court many years longer. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Not translate into the ability to spread it. And that's an inference. What we know about the empirical studies looking at uh, infected children versus infected adults and spread within their families, within their home dwelling units, is that children are very, very infrequently the, the cause of spread to other family members. It's almost always the adults spread to children, not the other way around. So we know from empirical uh, studies that children don't spread the infection. And that being the case, there's little rationale for putting, uh, you know, masking children where we don't know that the benefit that the mask has appreciable benefit. On top of the fact that the children don't really spread the infection very much. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at Rumble.com. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. By the way, have you contracted the coronavirus? Have you had it? I have. I had it about a year ago. Well, did you make the argument that the immunity is stronger than the vaccine? Uh, Not in my religious exemptions uh, interview. I did not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that argument's essentially removed. It's not on the table. We we tried to negotiate that at the beginning um, with our association, and it just wasn't an argument the city was having because they were saying we're tied to the mandate, and the mandate doesn't allow for that. Amazing. I I, I played the other day an an undercover video by an organization called Project Veritas. Uh, and they recorded three scientists with Pfizer, all admitting that contracting the coronavirus and surviving it gives you stronger immunity than the vaccine, all admitting it. And a couple of them admitted that they can't say it publicly. They sign non-disclosure agreements. And if they ever said anything about this, uh, they'd be in real deep, deep, deep trouble. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at Rumble.com. 
streaming on Salem Now. This is a story of how a million children were placed with local foster families through an unlikely alliance between the Chinese government and a British footballer. Parents from all walks of life share their stories of overcoming the one-child policy by taking in orphans. With unprecedented access across the country, this is a unique insight into the lives of the 90s orphans now driving the 21st century's fastest growing economy. This story needs to be told across the world. At a time where there's so much negativity and cynicism, here's proof that a single leap of faith can change the world. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. Ilhan Omar is back at it again. You know, she's been kind of quiet lately. She told her constituents Saturday at a town hall meeting that the rise in gun violence in Minneapolis and the increase in carjackings is due to the police. They have chosen, she said, not to fulfill their oath of office and provide the public safety they owe to the citizens. Now, this is rich coming from her. She goes from wanting to defund the police to blaming the police for not being responsive enough as people are getting murdered and their cars getting jacked in Minneapolis. Strapping little defenseless beagle puppies into cages where their little faces are eaten off by giant sand flies. You're, you, you, let, let me tell, tell me some more about the Tony Fauci dolls. I want to hear some more about people wearing their Tony Fauci shirts. How long does this guy get to stay in power? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway, joined by Admiral James Stavridis, retired United States Navy, former Allied Supreme Commander of NATO. Good morning, Admiral. How are you? Doing well, and I'm pleased to announce I'm inside the Beltway, too, uh, here oh. in Washington for a couple of days. Well, are you over at the offices of Carlisle Group today? I will be there for much of the day, indeed. Well, I wanted to ask you, since you know Glenn Youngkin well, you've been with the Carlisle Group for a number of years, Admiral. Uh, I know you don't do politics, you don't do R&D. Just tell us about Glenn. Uh, he's tall. He's telegenetic. <laughs> he's a superb athlete. Um, he was a good boss. He cares about people. He's smart. He understands the world, and he understands economics. I'm happy to see him run because he is someone who has a deep sense of service to others. Um, I make no political comment here. I'm a registered independent, always have been. Uh, I'm not voting in Virginia, but I do know Glenn Young, and he is a good man. That's, that's basically what I wanted people to hear. I'll talk to him in the next segment. We'll catch up on that. I have gotten good reports about uh, Youngkin enthusiasm from... South Alexandria and North Alexandria, which is the heart of blue Democrat land. So I think it's going to be a good night for Glenn Youngkin. Admiral, I wanted to ask you about this Financial Times headline this morning. China tells citizens to stockpile food as COVID controls are tightened. Communist Party newspaper says no reason for alarm, but admits families are running low on supplies. China has warned families to store food and other essentials in case of emergencies as a small COVID-19 outbreak is reported. What do you make of that, Admiral? I'd be worried if I were uh, President Xi. I think that um, China has taken a very draconian approach to a COVID from the very beginning, meaning if they have one case of COVID in a Disneyland-sized uh, park, they will not only close the park, but they'll literally quarantine everyone who is in the park that day. 
And um, that goes beyond the science, at least as I understand it. It is um, the kind of tools that an authoritarian state will uh, use to crack down. So I think it's entirely possible because of the nature of this virus, it, it comes in these waves that there will be a need for a significant crackdown. That's clearly what President Xi is signaling. Now, Admiral, I want to bring you a second COVID story. There's another story out this morning that Russia has underreported COVID deaths, the excess death rate being 753,000 people over last year, but they hold their numbers down. Do you doubt the transparency of Russia, China, and every authoritarian regime when it comes to COVID fatality? And if so, why do they do that? It doesn't seem to be exactly a confidence-inspiring measure. Um, I have extreme doubt about the reporting from a majority of these harsh authoritarian regimes. Another one you didn't mention is North Korea, which at one point was saying it had zero COVID cases, which is literally impossible in today's world. Um, it's a, it's a Orwellian. It's a common tool of an authoritarian state is to tell you that everything is just wonderful, hoping that you'll buy that and continue to support the goons that are in power. So this is clearly uh, one more page out of that playbook for all these nations. And again, the reason is to maintain control over the people, to maintain control over their minds. Now, Admiral, I'm going to take you to a place I assume you've been, the Philippines. <laughs> so many times. Uh, in so fact, many uh, times. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, my first overseas liberty port when I uh, was a young ensign uh, was uh, Subic Bay, a beautiful natural harbor that the U.S. Navy had a, a gorgeous uh, port facility there for years. Yeah, I've been in and out of the Philippines too many times to count. Yeah, my Marine buddies tell me that Subic Bay was kind of an unusual spot for sailors, that the shore patrol had busy duty. Yeah, that would be a, a polite way to put it. It was uh, All right. right right out of the movie, The Sand Pebbles. There you go. So today's Washington Post reports that decades-long communist rebel leader killed in the Philippines, Jorge Madlos, whose nom de guerre is Ka Oris, has been a leading figure and spokesman for the communist fighters in the southern Philippines' mountainous hinterland. Um, you know, this will come as a shock to many people that, They've been fighting since McSai's side, basically, in the Philippines. What do you understand about that conflict, Admiral, and how it impacts on the United States? It's much like the conflict that unfolded for 50 years just south of the United States in Colombia. It is a Marxist uh, separatist group which seeks to overthrow a democratically elected uh, government. And, you know, the Philippines has had problems with corruption over the years and dictators at times, obviously. But it's a vibrant democracy today. We may not always uh, be in perfect alignment with the elected leaders, but it's a functioning, vibrant democracy. Freedom of the press is strong. And uh, there is a communist group that has typically operated in the islands to the south. And as most folks will know, the Philippines are an enormous band, thousands of islands on the edge of the South China Sea, often in dispute, by the way, with China. And so uh, to the south, these rebel groups have been operating, trying to pull these uh, southern islands away. And ultimately, their goal was to overthrow the democratically elected governments in uh, Manila to the north. Always been tension in the Philippine islands between north and south. Um, kind of similar to what happened in Colombia, the U.S. helped the Philippine military, helped the Philippine government. We've had special forces operating there for decades. And over time, the capabilities of those Filipino forces, the, the insurgent forces in the South, uh, have been greatly diminished. I think the Philippines are on their way to a, a new election, probably a new leader. Uh, President Duterte has indicated he will not stand for another election. Uh, I think that's a good thing in the sense that it, it will give us a, a fresh leader to work with. And um, I think the future overall is quite bright for the Philippines. So, Admiral, counterinsurgency in Colombia and Philippines appears to have worked over a long period of time, and most Americans don't know we were doing that. What's that tell us about the model for American-supported counterinsurgency efforts? Um, I think Colombia in particular is the model. 
and we called it, you know, with our usual imagination, we called it Plan Columbia. And it was a bipartisan effort by, by, under Democrat and Republican, because that is the key. To beat an insurgency, you have to have immense patience, decades of work often. And it's not sending the 82nd Airborne down there. It's not sending 150,000 troops like we did to Iraq or to Afghanistan. A better model is small numbers of US troops, particularly special forces. Um, and when I commanded that mission as commander US Southern Command in charge of everything south of the United States, military to military, we never had more than 900 sailors in Colombia at any time. Huge nation, the size of Afghanistan, roughly the same population, 40 million. Yet we helped the people of Colombia overturn this Marxist insurgency known as the FARC by a steady application of counterinsurgency techniques, tactics, and procedures. We've done much the same thing in the Philippines. That's the right model for the U.S. when we want to help neighbors. Last question, Admiral. With the success in the Philippines, is there a chance that we will return in force as a naval presence at Subic Bay? I know that it was during one of the convulsions in Filipino politics that the United States was tossed out. It seems to me always to have been a major defeat. I think it happened under President Clinton. I'm not sure. But should we be back there? Would the Filipinos welcome us? It is a immensely powerful <coughs> strategic position. And it was not only Subic Bay and the naval complex, QB Point was the naval airfield associated with it, but also Clark Air Force Base in the north near uh, Manila, not so far apart actually. Um, and so that hub went away when we were invited to leave, which we did of course. Um, there has been sporadic discussion about reestablishing at least some kind of forward basing there. Um, I think it is a topic well worth exploring with the new administration when it comes to power in the Philippines. Uh, geography will have its way with us. This is the gateway to the South China Sea, the Philippine Islands. I hope that uh, Secretary of State Blinken is listening this morning, Admiral, because I, well, he's not. He's in Glasgow unless they're listening in the middle of the day. But thank you, Admiral James Stavridis. Follow him on Twitter at Stav Redis. I think that's all it is. Good morning and thank you, Admiral. Uh, time to remind all of you out there that if you're trying to find a port to put your investments in and you don't really have an advisor and you do have to diversify because inflation is coming, remember keycitycapital.com slash you. Keycitycapital.com slash you. A great, great sponsor of this program. I've never had a wealth advisor on the national show before. And I sat down with Charlie Dombeck from Key City Capital Advisors uh, and, and had a long conversation about what they do and how they do it and for whom they do it. And if this is you, listen, you've got a lot of money in stocks and you're worried about that. You've got your retirement heavily leveraged into equities and bonds and you're worried about that because the stock market can't keep going up, although Brian Westbury says it's going to go up for another 10 to 12 months. Fine. What are you going to do? That's when you call Charlie Dombeck. KeyCityCapital.com slash Hugh. KeyCityCapital.com slash Hugh. First, they'll begin with a scrub of your taxes to make sure you weren't overpaying, to make sure you don't overpay this year. Then they'll look at diversification. Remember, concentration is the secret to wealth accumulation. Diversification is the secret to wealth preservation. That's what Key City Capital does. Usually... Not always, but usually through investments in pooled resources buying mid-market apartment complexes, which are like coupon clipping without the dangers of the Fed destroying the value of the coupon. No, that's the way they go. Talk to Charlie about it, keycitycapital.com. Let me also remind all of you, relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com. It's election day. Maybe you're going to walk to the polls. I walked to the polls when I voted early. Maybe you're going to walk to the polls. It's a long way. You're just going to make a beautiful, it's a crisp northern Virginia morning. Uh, driving to the studio, it's cold. Uh, but it will warm up as the sun comes up. Relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com, relief factor. 1995 gets you started. Don't forget, take it every single day. If you're going to walk to the voting booth today, go get your relieffactor.com. Here's why you got to get to vote. Terry McAuliffe, cut number one. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. 
Let's play that again. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. One more time on Terry McAuliffe. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. That was in the last debate, in the last rally, last night. Here's what Terry McAuliffe said, cut number five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. So let's divert. All right, you just heard it. Teachers, I know you're told by your union to vote for Jerry McCall. You're going to fire uh, 30% of the white teachers in order to rise the diversity number. It's nuts. Kelly O'Donnell, MSNBC report on Joe Biden falling asleep at COP26, number 14. Yes, this Kelly. is the fifth day of the president's overseas tour, and he was uh, seen on camera with his eyes closed. It appears that perhaps he was dozing, and in these settings, uh, cameras are all around, and the camera caught uh, President Biden, who turned 79 later this month, uh, with his eyes closed for a period of time. And you're all right, right you can cast be the first embarrassing stone. situations. Dwayne you can't have the we, we put the Dwayne cam on and he's usually nodded off there when he's in. You can't say anything about President Biden falling asleep, but you can get to the polls and vote for Glenn Youngkin this morning. Don't forget Tim Butler in Loveland, Ohio. Don't forget our governor's race in New Jersey. Don't forget school board races everywhere. We get out there, Virginia, and vote for Youngkin. He joins me after the break. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. Facebook did two things basically in the 2020 election, one of which we've known about for a while. They basically censored information that was negative about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. They promoted information that was negative about Donald Trump. And I really believe uh, that swung the election in a really important way. But I, I think more profoundly, I think that Zuckerberg, what we're learning is that he put $420 million dollars to buy up local boards of elections. He did it in an extremely partisan way. And I think it basically rigged the election. I mean, I, you know, all of us are, are, are sort of scratching our heads wondering what really went on in 2020. And I think a big piece of the puzzle is understanding that it was not the people's representatives that were counting ballots, that were canvassing right. elections. It was partisan hacks that were installed by one of the most powerful people in our country. So have we seen enough of a response to that, a requisite pushback in the last 10 months? Are we going to see it just happen next next year? Will it be a billion dollars, J.D.? You know, I, I don't think there will be a billion dollars. But but look, this is this is where humans have the ability to push back against this stuff. Right. You know, we're, we're, we need to be men of action in this moment. And Americans need to say, look, no more of this. We need to actually ban Zuckerberg money coming in and buying up Democratic votes in our elections, or we're not, never going to have a free and fair election in this country ever again. People are woken up to it, so I think there's going to be a little bit more hesitancy from people like Zuckerberg to go in and buy the election. But when they try to do it, and they will, Seb, we need to be ready to push back. We yeah. need to be filing lawsuits. We need to be you know, getting up and protesting. We need to be aware of what's going on. And I think we're, again, I'm optimistic because we are at least aware of what happened now. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe today at rumble.com. Streaming on Salem Now. Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Schools are lining up to 
push the transgender agenda on kids and cut parents out of the equation. Go to Salem now. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway Live on this Tuesday morning election day in Virginia, New Jersey, Ohio, and many places around the United States. But the governor's race in Virginia has drawn the most attention nationally. The Republican nominee for governor, uh, Garrett Glenn Youngkin, joins me now. Uh, good morning, Glenn Youngkin. You ran through the tape last night in Loudoun County. Well, Hugh, we had a big event yes, last night in Loudoun County, but we had a great day yesterday. We had a great 10 days on our bus tour. We started in Roanoke yesterday morning with a giant crowd, and then in Richmond we had a big crowd, and then in, in Virginia Beach, which is where I grew up, we had a huge crowd, and then Loudoun County last night was overwhelming. I mean, I think everybody in Loudoun County was there. It was so <laughs> much fun to see everybody come together and, and really try to bring this home for Virginia. Now, last night, your opponent, Terry McAuliffe, uh, was in a sparse crowd, according to the New York Times. And this is what he had to say that I want to get your comment on. Cut number uh, five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. So let's diversify. So here's what I'm going to do. So, Glenn Youngkin, I am not concerned about diversity in teachers. I am concerned with whether or not kids are learning. Has Terry McAuliffe just been tone deaf to this for the entire campaign? Yeah, well, I think he's just tone deaf. <laughs> Honestly, I don't, even, don't limit it to this topic. I mean, at the end of the day, we've been talking about low taxes. We've been talking about our schools to educating our children to get ready for life so that they're taught how to think, not what to think, and they have high standards. We, we've been talking about investing in our law enforcement community so that we can make our community safe again and getting our job machine cranked up because it's totally stalled out. I mean, these are the issues that Virginians are most focused on. These are the kitchen table issues that every evening at dinner, and, and oh, by the way, when that midnight shift is finished and that kitchen table's for breakfast, Virginians are talking about, and I don't know what Terry McAuliffe's talking about in all candor. He's trying to find some page out of a playbook that he wrote for the Democratic Party on how to introduce race into this election, when the reality is this election is about Virginia's future, not our past. This is why we're going to sweep today. We've got to get everybody out to vote. Boy, the momentum is big, Hugh, and, and I, just, I just look forward to seeing Virginians come together in a way we haven't done in a long time. The momentum is, in fact, palpable for those of us who live in Virginia with Yunkin signs in the deep bluest parts of the state, including Old Town, Alexandria, Arlington, and Fairfax County. So, Glenn Yunkin, down ticket. You want a lieutenant governor and attorney general. You want a House of Delegates with a Republican majority if you're going to get anything done, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I, I, I think it's really going to happen. Winsome Sears, who's our lieutenant governor candidate, is awesome. Jason Miars, who's our attorney general candidate, is going to be an amazing attorney general. And I think we're going to get back six, seven, eight seats in our House of Delegates, and we're going to have a working majority. But, of course, the Senate's still going to be controlled by the, by the Democrats because the Senate's not up. And so we're going to work across the aisle. I think when we focus on these most important issues of low taxes and the best jobs and the best schools and the safest communities – these are, the, these are the issues that we can come together around. We've got a really clear agenda on day one we're going to go work on and get done and deliver results. There's a lot of talent in Virginia, Governor. I've lived here off and on my whole life. And in southwest Virginia and northeast Virginia, in the Tidewater or out in the West Virginia border, there are a lot of very talented people who have made Virginia their home. How are you going to put together your team if you win tonight? Well, we're going we're to have a team that represents all of Virginia. And I think one of the things we're going to do, Hugh, is is we're going to shift power away from the Marble Halls in Richmond, and we're going to get out into Virginia. And so people always say to me, well, Glenn, we're gonna, can we have a meeting in Richmond? And I say, no, I'm going to see you. And so we're looking forward to spending time across Virginia and bringing all this talent that you're exactly right exists everywhere to go to work for all Virginians. And I was in southwest Virginia on Sunday. We had a series of fabulous events, and, yeah, there are a lot of incredibly talented folks, not only to help us, help us serve Virginians, but to go to work and lead initiatives, lead initiatives to make everybody's life in southwest Virginia better. Last question, Glenn Young, and the Wall Street Journal today reports that farewell offshoring, outsourcing, pandemic rewrites, CEO, CEO playbook. American businesses are bringing factories back 
to the United States. They're going to look for a place to land. How do you make Virginia come back? I remember Rick Perry coming over to California with sticky fingers gloves and grabbing businesses. How do you do that for Virginia to get these jobs into the Commonwealth? Well, we're going to make sure that everybody knows Virginia is open for business. We're going to protect our right to work status, which has been under threat recently, and it will not be when I'm serving Virginia as governor. But we're going to cut our regulations way back. The Virginia Code is 37,000 pages long. We're going to get a tax structure in place that, that makes it more affordable for Virginians to live here so people want to work for these great companies. And, and gee, we're going to go get them. And the reality is Virginia's forgotten how to compete. We've just kind of sat here and thought that people might just show up because we keep re- 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 receiving these CNBC rankings. Well, rankings don't do anything for you. You've got to go get it. And so one of the things I've done in 30 years is I know how to build business and create jobs, and I know how to go get business. And so this is where we're going to go. And, and all those other governors that I so look forward to com- having a healthy competition with across the nation, get ready because Virginians awake again. Clear eyes, clean heart. Glenn Youngkin, congratulations on a great campaign. And to Mrs. Youngkin and the kids who have been there every step of the way with you, good luck today. I know you'll be working the polls throughout the state throughout Election Day. Polls are open in Virginia. They will stay open until 7 p.m. tonight. So get out and vote, Virginia. I'm Hugh Hewitt from the Beltway. Stay tuned. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Key City Capital. powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized to go after perceived domestic enemies. And that's very scary. Our constitutional democracy enshrines the peaceful transfer of power. We are now all rooting for his success. The peaceful transition of power is one of the hallmarks of our democracy. We don't live in the United States of America as as any of us would like to understand it. We have a peaceful transition of power process. That's not what happened. They interviewed General Flynn, and they did it in what was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. And the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. This is what third world security states do. They spy on their political opponents like this. This is part of a concerted uh, Russian influence operation. Russian interference. They colluded. They were in on it. He would constantly say, I have seen evidence of collusion. Until this is released, I can't comment. I can't go into the particulars. Russians, I'm not going to be specific. He knew he could just say it on TV and then hide behind. Well, it's all classified. I can't get into it. Well, it's classified. You can't see it. Collusion. You just got to be willing to see it. New York's Daily News ran this front page, Trump is Hitler. How could 62 million Americans vote for Hitler? Are 62 million Americans Nazis? We really almost thought it was a joke. Like, really, you're not going to accept that you lost this election? Then they see the Russia collusion narrative sitting right there in front of them and say, why don't we just say that he cheated? It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. It's given this is around the- who are bad faith actors a license to do whatever they want because they literally feel like they're fighting Russian spies, this is around- Nazis. Russia in the United States, but the governor... The most egregious abuse of everything that was supposed to have been good about our government. The thing that they were investigating the Trump campaign for is what they themselves were doing. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. Justice is giving to every single man what is their due. There is a yearning for justice in the soul of humanity. And when a regular, normal American earning $55,000 a year, a police officer, a teacher, a firefighter, 
turns on TV or they find out that thousands of people are just wanting to waltz into the country, they start to feel as if that's not fair. It doesn't, you don't need an over explanation for this. The caravan and the subsequent illegal invasion of our country cuts at the core of American justice. A seven year old can see what's happening on the southern border and can say there's something not right about that. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. They used social media and they said that they would do whatever it took to make sure that he wasn't able to communicate directly with the people in an unfiltered fashion. And so they said about everything from deplatforming effective conservative voices, censoring the president and other people, creating algorithmic uh, chaos where if you search for information, it would devalue information from right-leaning sources and elevate those on the left. Um, you know, massive amounts of deplatforming and marginalizing of conservative voices to the tune. Of, I mean, this, this actually probably had more effect than anything, including propaganda media's malfeasance, malfeasance in the election. But it's a, uh, it, they just they exerted massive control. And, you know, to think that it still came within 43,000 votes in three states, even after all they did, is it tells you just how much they did, I think. So I'm putting you on the spot here. The president, the former president, President Trump's continued statement that the election was, quote, stolen. A, is it a word you would use? B, do you think he should use it? I don't try to give him advice, but no. I mean, I love the word rigged, which is why I named the book Rigged. Before votes even happened, everything was designed to orchestrate a particular outcome, whether that was fake news or censorship tech control of everything, changing election laws, funding of elections. I think sometimes people just get a little bit too much into the semantics, like call it what you want. We just need to know what happened and whether it should be allowed to happen. But I really like the word rigged. This is why I named the book that. Yes, it makes sense. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Tesla was a genius. His most amazing discoveries thought to be written in a lost journal. Now in the right hands, it could revolutionize the 21st century, but in the wrong hands. Kill him. Kill him. If you can stop an earthquake, doesn't that mean you could start one too? That's why that notebook should never fall into the wrong hands. There's an old brown battered notebook in my office at work. You have to find it, take it, and keep it hidden at all costs. The, uh, the G20 leaders meeting downtown, they're in danger. In fact, the, the whole of downtown could be in danger. If we are to build a superhuman, we must first eliminate those who are flawed. People are created equally. All of downtown, the high-rises were built on rollers to withstand horizontal shakes. A vertical quake this size could collapse half of downtown. We have commenced the countdown. Shall we stop this thing? Save, Save the universe! universe. For the um, referees, however, uh, this isn't about me, and it's not about me dispelling, uh, you know, what's being said about me, particularly or for anybody. It's just saying, you know, I'm standing with all those that, uh, you know, believe in what's right and are doing what's right for themselves. You know, everybody has a personal choice with their lives. Um, you know, everybody has a right to feel a certain type of way. Everybody's entitled to their own opinions. Everybody's entitled to, to do what they feel is best for themselves, you know, and, and putting me as a hero or painting me as a villain, sort of say, or going against the vaccine mandates. Like, that wasn't, that wasn't my intent at all. And to be sitting in this seat here and seeing, 
you know, the way that this is dividing our world up, you know, being vaccinated or being unvaccinated, uh, you know, it's just sad to see. Uh, it's, it's creating a lot of division, a lot of confusion, you know, a lot of people saying things that are untrue. Um, we're not giving space for each other to speak. You know, you got doctors out here working hard, physicians out here working hard, and um, everybody's trying to do what's best for them and their families, which I respect. And I'm always going to put that first. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Morning, Gloria, America, bonjour, hi, Canada, Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway, all eyes on Virginia as polls are open and will remain open until 7 p.m. tonight, East Coast time, as Virginians go to the polls. Glenn Youngkin, the Republican nominee versus Terry McAuliffe, the Democratic nominee, widely understood that Terry McAuliffe has flailed around and dug himself holes from which he cannot get out. That Youngkin has ran a dip disciplined, very on-message campaign about education and jobs and is going to win tonight, probably handily. What will Democrats do with that? Well, they'll first look at New Jersey to find out, did Phil Murphy actually come close to losing? Did people send a message in New Jersey as well? They'll look at school board races across the United States. As incumbents get tossed out, they'll look at city councils like Loveland, Ohio, where my friend Tim Butler is on the ballot, and I hope you get out and vote, Loveland, for Tim. Throw a bullet, as they say. Just vote for one. You can vote for three people. Just vote for Tim. Make sure a smart Michigan lawyer who had the great brains to return to Ohio to practice in law and raise his family gets back into office in Loveland, Ohio, Tim Butler. But I want to read to you my Washington Post piece which is on the landing page at WashingtonPost.com. I wrote it yesterday, posted about 3 p.m. yesterday. It will stay up for a couple more hours. It will surprise no one that I think Glenn Youngkin is going to win Tuesday's vote in the Virginia governor's race. I begin. Former Governor Terry McAuliffe spent Sunday morning on Meet the Press, which was an appeal for help to the Beltway suburbs where the Sunday shows matter far more than they do in Virginia Beach, Richmond, and Lynchburg, much less rural Virginia. While Yunkin was barnstorming to crowds of a thousand people, McAuliffe made his pitch to sparsely attended rallies, according to the New York Times. I expect Yunkin to emerge as the winner early on Tuesday evening. Terry McAuliffe will call up and concede, I bet, by 9 o'clock, maybe 10. The question then becomes, what do congressional Democrats do in response? President Biden is fixated on spending massive amounts of federal money despite his falling favorability ratings and, of course, the rise in inflation. Will Democrats in Congress study a Yunkin win and conclude, hmm, let's change course? The rest of the column explains why they won't do that. They're stuck on stupid. They will not pay attention, except for Joe Manchin. Now, there are two things in life that are pretty reliable. One, the Browns will come back. Just take some time. Master Chief Kurt in San Diego, do not despair. I understand you're a Browns fan and you're despairing in San Diego. Do not despair. Browns are great. They're fine. They have a 60% chance of making the playoffs when they beat Joe Burroughs this weekend in Cincinnati. They just got to get everyone back off the IR. The second thing you need to remember, besides that, Master Chief, is that what begins in Virginia spreads. So if Youngkin, in fact, delivers a big win tonight, and in a state that went for Joe Biden, any win is a big win, but I think it's going to be more significant than that, the Democrats should look at their playbook on the Hill and stop spending money because inflation is real and it's killing people. It's genuinely killing people. They can't afford the gas. They can't afford the groceries. They can't afford anything. And their promised relief, Medicare expansion to cover hearing aids. That's it. Bernie Sanders, who's an old guy who can't hear, is fixated on Medicare hearing aids. And others are fixated on the Green New Deal. This is not what Americans want. They want their schools reopened, rebuilt, and repopulated with great teachers. That's what Glenn Youngkin's been running on. Meanwhile, 
Terry McAuliffe is running on this. Cut number five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. All right, what is that? 1-800-520-1234. Yeah, we'll take a priority for Virginia. We'll keep a couple of, of uh, lines open for Virginia folks. I know that the uh, lines are long in some places, and there's a lot of enthusiasm among the Yunkin poll workers. I've had two reports, actually three this morning, of that from um, out in far Fairfax, in uh, Alexandria, which is deep blue, I've had a lot of reports of enthusiastic lines of voters wearing Yunkin stickers and talking to the Yunkin volunteers and a desolate, desolated Democratic Party. It's raining as well in parts of Virginia this morning, which is never good for Democrats. But this is what Terry said yesterday. I, I just can't get over it. Cut number five. So let's Cut number five. five. So here's what I'm going to do. And oh. I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody... Okay, let me ask Denise in Virginia. What does Terry McAuliffe want to do in schools, given what he just cited, Denise? Hello, Denise. Is she gone? Is she still there? Is no one clicking on her? Hey, Denise, I'm sorry about that. Hello. Good morning. You're on. Terry McAuliffe does sound very, very pro CRT. Yes, he does. Where do you live, Denise? I live in Duffield. I live in extreme southwest Virginia, the next to the last county down there in the TF. It now, everybody, everybody focuses on Northern Virginia and the D.C. suburbs, but Southern Virginia turns out the vote. Have you voted this morning, or did you vote by absentee? I have voted this morning. The, the thing that bothers me the most is I've seen Yunkin signs, but I did not even know the Sears lady's name until I saw her on Life, Liberty, and Levin on that Sunday. Well, and good I for you. I see that. Well, you know, down ticket races in every state usually depend on the top of the ticket because that's where the visibility and the money goes. But that's a good race. I think the House of Delegates is in play as well. I just want to know if, if there were Yunkin poll workers at your place of voting. There were two young boys there, but neither spoke to me. Well, there they can't. They're not allowed to. There. Yes. Yeah, they're well, not allowed to. At least can't. They usually at least hand out sample ballots. Uh, if if they are outside, they can do that. If they are inside being observers, they can't. And uh, Team Yunkin has at least two observers in every election precinct. Denise, the connection isn't very great, but thank you for trying. I appreciate it. Let's go to Scranton and talk to Brandon. Hello, Brandon. Hey, Brandon, are you there? Nope. He dropped. Uh, we're having issues with our phone system this morning. Back at, uh, I tell you, it's sort of like Joe Biden at COP26, 1-800-520-1234. Uh, the president fell asleep at the climate summit yesterday, and as a result, he's a little disturbed. In fact, Kelly O'Donnell talked about it on MSNBC yesterday, cut 14. Yes, this Kelly. is the fifth day of the president's overseas tour, and he was uh, seen on camera with his eyes closed. It appears that perhaps he was dozing, and in these settings... Uh, cameras are all around, and the camera caught uh, President Biden, who turned 79 later this month, uh, with his eyes closed for a period of time. And you're right; these can be embarrassing situations. You have the contract, Chuck, of, and that does, he President certainly Biden isn't in Virginia helping Terry McAuliffe. Uh, Scott in Fairfax, Virginia, pretty blue area. Hello, Scott. Long time listener. Um, I actually live here and work um, for the school district. And we started this uh, this deal about the the ratio of teachers to um, I'm gonna I'm on the administrator side, but the teachers to to student ratio. This started two years ago with us. It's um, way 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 worse than most people know and think. 
Well, well, it's it's illegal. It's unconstitutional to hire on the basis of race. What are they doing? When I went to that, when I went to that training, and then they brought it up, I looked at my guy next to me, and I'm like, "This is crazy. You can't do this. You're high, you're. This is a quota, right? Straight up front. But this was two. I'm telling you, this was two years ago. We started this. What training did you have to go to, Scott? Um, well, we're on. <clears throat> We have modules, and we're on module seven of of this type of training. So who knows? It's 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 mind boggling. You, it's just mind boggling. Well, again, take people inside your world. When we see teacher training days, for example, Virginia is off today, so that the teachers union can get their poll workers out. When when we talk about CRT and Terry McAuliffe says it doesn't exist, what do you think when you hear him saying that? Um, well. You know, in the you're a you're a lawyer, so in the letter of the of the word, we don't have books and we don't have a class called you know CRT training on on either side, be it classroom or or administrator training. But it's all cloaked in this you know equity and all these other words, and and we're there. There's training year round for this, and we started it over two years ago. I'm telling you, it, two it's years got ago. to end. Equity is simply CRT, and it's all unconstitutional. Race consciousness has been unconstitutional in this country since Brown v. Board in 1954. Press on in the schools. I appreciate your serving the schools, my friend. Don't go anywhere, America. 1-800-520-1234. If you are a Virginia voter, give me a call. 1-800-520-1234. I'm Hugh Hewitt in the Beltway. It's Election Day in New Jersey, Virginia. And don't forget Loveland, Ohio. Go Tim Butler. Stay tuned, America. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. How buoyed are you that Americans are finally waking up, J.D.? Look, I'm very excited about what I'm seeing, you know, certainly in Virginia, but also in Ohio. Uh, it feels like there's a real grassroots movement brewing on the conservative movement right now. And it's, you know, j- just like in, in times past, it's not just the politicos. It's not just the establishment folks. Sometimes not even people who are that political, but they're just very fired up about what their kids are teaching. You know, their 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 kids are coming home crying, upset because they're being told that they're a, you know, a bad person depending on the color of their skin, and they're just fed up about it. And I think it, you know, it may very well take down Terry McAuliffe, but I certainly think it is the beginning of a movement all across this country. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. Justice is something a country must at least attempt to get right. You're going to have things that fall through the cracks. You're going to have externalities. You're going to have issues. But you have to at least try to make a country just. The current regime is basically saying we don't even want to attempt to preserve the American ideal of justice. That justice is nothing more than us being in charge and you being under our power. Socrates said, it is, is it not the purpose of a juryman's office to give justice as favor to whoever seems good to him, but to judge according to the law? This is what he has sworn to do. Our people in charge, our leaders, were sworn to protect our country. 1.7 million people just waltz right into the country. They get to have anchor babies. The other side wants to give them amnesty, wants to make them citizens. This is not sustainable. We know it's not sustainable. And the ruling class in both parties, by the way, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, they want this for votes. They want this for government dependency. They want this for cheap labor. Now, I'm pleased to see that Texas is now stepping up and saying we're not going to put up with this. Texas needs to defy federal authority, arrest every single person that comes from this caravan. They need to be welcoming this caravan, not with benefits and signs, but with handcuffs and chartered flights back to right where they came from. Immediately. No questions asked. Don't put them in front of the judge. Put them on a plane and get them back. They broke the law. That would be justice. A seven-year-old would say, yeah, they deserve to go back because they broke our laws. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at Rumble.com. Streaming on Salem Now. We'll see one young lady identify as transgender 
And the next thing you know, six or seven young ladies in that same school are now identifying as transgender. Children taught at age five they can create their gender identity and it's being celebrated. Schools are lining up to push the transgender agenda on kids and cut parents out of the equation. Every cell of their body that has a nucleus is male or female. We've now seen parents losing custody of their children if they don't go along with this. We've all been created XY or XX, so that means there's only two genders. And so really the battle is against the creator. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. The most powerful organs of the state are not merely corrupt, but that they've been weaponized. We are now all rooting for his success. That's not what happened. It was a complete ambush. I thought it's early enough. Let's just send a couple guys over. And the audience was, ha, 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 ha. How funny to set up an innocent man. It divided the country in ways that people can't imagine. It's inspired massive violence. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. I grew up Pope, which is even worse than being in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Wake me up, America. That's what you ask me to do every day. I'm Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway. Glad you were with me. Head towards the big event today, the Virginia gubernatorial election. Let me talk with Mike in Virginia. Good morning, Mike. I'm uh, Hugh Hewitt. Where are you? Uh, actually, I'm in Front Royal right now, but I'm from Winchester, but work in D.C. Kind of an oddball combination. My, my comment about McCullough's comments I believe that buffoon doesn't have any logic whatsoever because he's systematically planning to violate the 14th Amendment for our students. If 75% of the whites are teachers, but 50% of the students are blacks, where is the rest of the white population in Virginia? They're in private schools where McCullough sent his children private schools because he knows the quality there. He should be supporting the proper quality equity to make sure that all students, public and private, get the same quality education. He has no logic, he has no sense, and he has no vote from anybody that I know. He's a loon. He, he, he is absolutely race-obsessed. And like the Democratic Party, is identity politics driven. And I believe he's going to be repudiated today, Mike. Do, do you know anyone voting for McAuliffe out loud? No, no, none whatsoever. And talking with my uh, brethren that work at, uh, in D.C., they see nobody. And I, I work with a lot of people from Northern Virginia, and none of them think McAuliffe should be there. It is about the race problem that they see because they're trying to systematically make sure there's a race divide, not minimize it or nullify it. And that's it, why I agree. Mike, I think you will be feeling pretty good by tonight, by 9, maybe 10 p.m. Uh, Chief Justice Robertson, Seattle School District, a big case from uh, more than a decade ago, said the way to end racism in America is to stop using race. And that is the bottom line. Thank you so much, Mike. The bottom line is to stop referring to race if you want to end racism in America. 1-800-520-1234. Connection to the Hugh Hewitt Show. I want to uh, quickly cover for you the market update brought to you by Andrew and Todd.com. Andrew Del Rey, Todd Avakian, great sponsors of the Hugh Hewitt Show. If you're buying a house, if you're trying to get money out of your house by refinancing at these great low rates, the 10-year treasury is at 1.575% this morning. That means that you still have the opportunity to grab on to the lowest interest rates in my lifetime. It's been about a year and a half now that they settled down in the high twos or low threes. And maybe you missed the very lowest rate. But that doesn't mean you sleep on it. 
All right, so you say, and, and you're, you know it's a pain in the neck. It's not with andrewandtodd.com. Sierra Pacific Mortgage is a lender. So they don't refer you to somebody they don't know or control. They absolutely handle your application. They will get you in. They will get you taken care of. Yesterday was a good day on all markets in the United States. The Nasdaq went up uh, 97 points. The Dow went up 94. And the S&P went up almost uh, eight and a third. So I'm telling you, the, the market will be healthy. I trust Brian Westbury. Uh, Brian tells me don't sell any stocks for 10 months. The amount of money the Fed is printing is going to be inflationary on stocks like it is on everything else. Then diversify in another, another year from now after Amazon and all the rest of them, Walmart, Costco, they all go up. Uh, portfolios go up. Mutual funds go up. Then you're going to have to worry about inflationary impact on your life. But get your 30-year fixed rate low and in place before that happens. 888-888-1172 connects you with um, our friends there. Shane, Lakewood, Cal California. Hi, Shane. You're on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Yeah, my, my theory on all this is that the Democrats uh, get any more than 20% votes in anything. I don't care if it's city council, governor, uh, the next presidential election. If they if they need any more than twenty percent, uh, all it is is uh, just a little. Let's have a party and, and uh, you know have, have a little, little celebration. But for the long run, it does not squat. Because Shane, you're too much of a pessimist. Uh, the elections are fine, free and fair in the United States. We do need observers everywhere. We've got them. And we are making changes where changes are necessary through state legislatures. Get out and vote, America. It matters a great deal, whether it's Tim Butler in Loveland, Ohio, or Glenn Youngkin in Virginia. Get out and vote. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. This is Carol Platt-Lebow for townhall.com. 30 years have passed since Justice Clarence Thomas was confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. His tenure there has been consequential indeed. He's the court's foremost proponent of natural law, an understanding that our individual rights are transcendent and come from God. This understanding undergirds his approach to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, powerfully informing the justice's unyielding commitment to limited government and equal justice before the law. Over the last five years, Justice Thomas has authored more opinions than any of his colleagues on the Supreme Court. His influence only continues to grow. And he's beloved by the scores of people who know him. He knows the names of the children of the marshals who guard the courthouse. He's mentored generations of clerks, treating them like family. And his distinctive hearty laugh rings out within his judicial chambers. May God bless this great, good, and brilliant man. And may he serve on the court many years longer. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. Not translate into the ability to spread it. And that's an inference. What we know about the empirical studies looking at uh, infected children versus infected adults and spread within their families, within their home dwelling units, is that children are very, very infrequently the, the causes spread to other family members. It's almost always the adult spread to children, not the other way around. So we know from empirical uh, studies that children don't spread the infection. And that being the case, there's little rationale for putting, uh, you know, masking children where we don't know that the, benefit, that the mask has a preachable benefit on top of the fact that the children don't really spread the infection very much. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. And by the way, have you contracted the coronavirus? Have you had it? I have. I had it about a year ago. Well, did you make the argument that the immunity is stronger than the vaccine? Uh, not in my religious exemptions uh, interview. I did not. Mm -hmm. yeah, but that argument's essentially removed. It's not on the table. We, we right. tried to negotiate that at the beginning um, with our association, and it just wasn't an argument the city was having because they were saying we're tied to the mandate, and the mandate doesn't allow for that. Amazing. I, I, I played the other day an, an undercover video by an um, organization called Project Veritas, uh, and they recorded three scientists with Pfizer, 
all admitting that contracting the coronavirus and surviving it gives you stronger immunity than the vaccine, all admitting it. And a couple of them admitted that they can't say it publicly. They signed non-disclosure agreements. And if they ever said anything about this, uh, they'd be in real deep, deep, deep trouble. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Streaming on Salem Now. This is a story of how a million children were placed with local foster families through an unlikely alliance between the Chinese government and a British footballer. Parents from all walks of life share their stories of overcoming the one-child policy by taking in orphans. With unprecedented access across the country, this is a unique insight into the lives of the 90s orphans now driving the 21st century's fastest growing economy. This story needs to be told across the world. At a time where there's so much negativity and cynicism, here's proof that a single leap of faith can change the world. Look for Salem Now in the App Store or go to SalemNow.com. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. Ilhan Omar is back at it again. You know, she's been kind of quiet lately. She told her constituents Saturday at a town hall meeting that the rise in gun violence in Minneapolis and the increase in carjackings is due to the police. They have chosen, she said, not to fulfill their oath of office and provide the public safety they owe to the citizens. Now, this is rich coming from her. She goes from wanting to defund the police to blaming the police for not being responsive enough as people are getting murdered and their cars getting jacked in Minneapolis. That's the left. That's today's Democrat Party. It is an extraordinary thing to witness. They're anti-police. They're against parent involvement in their kids' curriculum. They want to gouge us with more and more taxes. They want to force you to comply. They'll cancel you if you don't comply, ask Dave Chappelle. And evidently, they're okay with strapping little defenseless beagle puppies into cages where their little faces are eaten off by giant sandflies. What's trending? Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Welcome back, America. A special welcome to WZFC News Talk 1400. First in the Valley in the Shenandoah Valley in Winchester, serving Frederick and Clark County. Get out and vote. Special good morning to Super Talk WFHG 92.9 in Bristol, Virginia. On the southern border, get out and vote. You folks in Virginia Beach and in Norfolk, get out and vote. And of course, on AM 970, the answer in for Northern Virginia, get out and vote. I'm joined by United States Senator Tom Cotton. Good morning, Senator. Good morning, Hugh. It's good to be on with you, and I'm glad that you have a far and deep reach into the Old Dominion. And I add my voice uh, to your encouragement to all Virginians to get out today and vote for Glenn Youngkin if you're tired uh, with Virginia not being a competitive state with its neighbors and higher taxes and your kids being indoctrinated hate America. And you want to send a message to Joe Biden and Democrats in the Congress to stop their radical socialist agenda. Uh, Senator Cotton, you've gone through... Two House generals, two Senate generals, election night. Uh, you've had primary election as well. Is, is election day the longest day for a candidate? Um, well, you know, there's not much left for a candidate to do on election day, Hugh. Um, you know, I had the benefit that uh, I planned to win, and all my races were called uh, pretty much immediately after the closing That's nice. bell. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, on my election days in the past, I've gone out and I've thanked my volunteers. I've uh, gone and... Um, call center to get out the vote operation to rally the troops because although a candidate can't do all that much more persuading on election day uh the massive operation that is a statewide campaign has a lot to do in terms of making sure that people are going to vote resolving any controversies with the polls so 
So there's thousands and thousands of hardworking uh, Republicans from Republican women to young Republicans, teenage Republicans who are rolling up their sleeves today to try to make sure that uh, Glenn Youngkin and the entire Republican ticket wins. And we owe them a, a special thanks. I know that Glenn Youngkin is going to be out thanking them today, even if uh, the uh, campaigning to persuade voters is more or less done at this point. Well, last night on election eve, Terry McAuliffe managed to contribute to the case against him, saying this, cut number five, Senator Cotton. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. So... All right, Senator Cotton, you went to Harvard Law School. I'm not sure they teach constitutional law there, but they did at Michigan, and I've been teaching it for 20. That's unconstitutional hiring based on race. It's just it's just blatantly unconstitutional. Well, it, yeah, and you could you could tell that it got uh, rousing applause from the tens <laughs> and tens of people, the tens and tens of people who have been showing up to Terry McAuliffe rallies. Um, I, I would further say, Hugh, here's what we can do to make kids feel comfortable in school. We can stand up to far left woke superintendents and school boards who are concealing rapes that occur in bathrooms because it interferes with their transgendered policies during Pride Month, and then who will transfer the perpetrator to another school where he can rape another girl. We can make sure that schools are teaching our students American history and Virginian history, teaching it straight, teaching it all, but not teaching our children to hate America not teaching them to see each other first and foremost as a representative of the uh, race uh, that their skin color reflects. Those are the things that we can make, uh, that we can do to help our kids feel comfortable and to learn in schools as opposed to unconstitutional hiring practices. Now, Senator Cotton, yesterday your colleague Joe Manchin got up and threw down on the House Democrats. I like to point out to the Steelers fans, West Virginia is next to Virginia. So I think he sees what's going on in Virginia in the repudiation of Terry McAuliffe and Joe Biden and says, you know, that's probably going to happen in West Virginia as well. Were you shocked or pleasantly surprised by Senator Manchin sit down and shut up to the House Democrats yesterday? Yeah, I, I thought that Senator Manchin put it very well yesterday when he said he's not going to vote for a bill that will set the country back that is full of gimmick and smoke and mirrors budgeting, which the Democrats openly admit this bill is. They openly admit that their so-called revenue raisers won't actually raise that much revenue, or that they are artificially ending programs after one, two, three, or six years, hoping that those programs will become entrenched and have to be extended. So Joe Manchin is just calling a spade a spade and saying he's not going to vote for such a bill. He's certainly not going to be rushed into voting for a bill by a bunch of far-left backbenchers in the House of Representatives. So those far-left backbenchers in the House of Representatives hold in their hands the infrastructure bill. What do you expect the far-left backbenchers to do when Nancy Pelosi is yelling at them? Well, Hugh, I thought it's interesting that not just uh, Joe Manchin uh, was speaking out publicly yesterday about uh, the House voting on that infrastructure bill, but some of those far-left backbenchers are now saying, no, no, they want to vote, too. They're ready to vote. And I think that it's not just Joe Manchin who recognizes the massive repudiation that's coming tonight in Virginia, but all those far-left backbenchers, and they don't want to be blamed tomorrow morning for having blocked votes on this legislation. So they're all, everyone, from Joe Manchin uh, to the squad, is rushing to deflect the blame for the massive drubbing that Democrats are about to take in Virginia. Well, you know, that is, to me, interesting, Senator. I have a column up at the Washington Post landing page. It says, Democrats got a message in 2010 when Scott Brown beat Martha Coakley to fill the the seat of the the late Ted Kennedy, and they didn't listen. They simply went ahead and passed Obamacare anywhere, and they got wiped out in 2010. They lost 63 House seats. Do you expect them to be tone deaf to whatever the message that Virginia sends tonight is? Hugh, mark it down. I'm not Nostradamus. I just know how Democrats behave. That after tonight, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden and the uh, Ocasio Cortezes and Bernie Sanders of the world are going to blame the defeat in Virginia on lack of democratic turnout, lack of democratic enthusiasm, and double down on their reckless taxing and spending bill. That they have to pu push forward, they have to pass it, it has to be even bigger and bolder, as Chuck Schumer always says. Now, they may be saying that in public, but something tells me that all those vulnerable, vulnerable Democrats in the House, people like Elaine Luria and Abigail Spanberger in Virginia, are not going to be buying 
what those Democrats are selling, because they know that this massive repudiation in Virginia tonight will spell doom for their party if they proceed. You know, Senator, I'm not even sure that the moderates can afford to bill, uh, to vote for uh, an infrastructure bill. With inflation on the prowl and rising, if they pump a trillion dollars into infrastructure, as is proposed in the infrastructure bill, which I originally supported, but I also pay attention to inflationary rates, those moderate Democrats are going to get blamed for inflation if they vote for this. Yeah, and, and remember, too, it's call, they're calling it the infrastructure bill, and there are some good provisions in that bill that would support better roads, for instance. But there's a lot in that bill that goes to wasteful, pie-in-the-sky, green energy projects, trying to get the camel's nose under the tent of the Green New Deal and basically give the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, a, a slush fund uh, to go along with John Kerry's ambition to remake our energy economy. Um, at a time when Americans are paying $4 at the pump and home heating rates for this winter are going to go through the roof. So there is a lot of peril for the Democrats if they rush headlong into not just their reckless tax and spending bill, but also an infrastructure bill that spends as much on things besides roads and highways as it does on those roads and highways. So, Senator, I want to switch to foreign affairs now and your service on the Armed Services Committee and Intel Committee. Uh, very slowly, reluctantly, Team Biden has let us know that there are 450-plus American citizens still in Afghanistan. We don't have a number for LPRs. We don't have a number for uh, uh, visa-eligible Afghans who assisted the American military in their mission there. Do you believe they will ever tell us the truth, and do you believe that those American citizens have been abandoned? Of course they've been abandoned, Hugh. After Joe Biden promised throughout the summer that he would not abandon them, And every one of his mouthpieces went out and assured the American people that, oh, there are fewer than 100 American citizens left, and most of them don't want to leave anyway. And now they're coming back to us and telling them it's four or five times that much. I don't know why anyone would believe them uh, in their current estimates, having lied to to us uh, back in August and September. Uh, And, of course, the feckless and humiliating uh, retreat from Afghanistan has simply emboldened our adversaries to stick a thumb in Uncle Sam's eye. I mean, Xi Jinping wouldn't even appear on video at the climate change conference in Scotland. Now, most Americans don't care about that, and frankly, I don't either, Hugh. But Xi Jinping knows what a huge priority that is for Joe Biden. So that is a direct rebuke to President Biden. Or look at Vladimir Putin, who's massively building up troops on the Ukraine, on the border of Ukraine, Hugh. Uh, this could be a dangerous flashpoint in the weeks ahead. Do you think uh, Vladimir Putin would be doing that if Joe Biden had proved so hapless in Afghanistan? I very much doubt it. Hapless is the word. It's a hapless presidency. He fell asleep at COP26 yesterday. Kelly O'Donnell reported on MSNBC. What's that send to the world as a message, Senator Cotton? Well, it probably signals how boring the topic is (laughs) in Glasgow and how little they're going to get done. If anything, they're going to contribute to to, uh, global warming with all the hot air coming out of the gas bags are gathered in Scotland. So, So in terms of, though, what it projects in terms of the frailty of the president. Look, the president is frail. Everybody sees that. Does that embolden Putin? Does it embolden Xi vis-a-vis Taiwan to know that we have an isolationist, weak, and physically uh, inert president? Yeah, well, um, Hugh, Joe Biden has been in Washington for 50 years, and he's wanted to be president that whole time. And for 50 years, no one in Washington thought that Joe Biden was up to that job, and he didn't magically get up to the job when he turned 78, when he wasn't up to it, when he was in his 40s or in his 60s. And I think that's obvious for everyone. He turned 79 this month. Uh, do you have any hopes that there's going to be any course correction after Virginia writes to, uh, votes tonight? You mark it down. Joe Biden and all the senior Democrats will say how the Virginia results just go to show that they need to double down and accelerate and expand their reckless tax and spending bill. Uh, I promise you that will be their message tomorrow, because what else can they say? Uh, they're not going to have a course correction and repudiate where they've been for eight months. But you do have enough vulnerable Democrats in the House that uh, I, did, I expect they'll have to pump the brakes at least for a while. I hope that there are five of them who say no mas, no mas. Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas, thank you for joining me on Election Day in Virginia. Hey, Virginia, get out and vote. Uh, this is why Terry McAuliffe is losing cut number one. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. Again, cut number one. I don't one. think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. One last time. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. 
Not only should parents shut up and sit down, but white teachers in Virginia are going to be purged under the logic laid out by Terry McAuliffe last night. Cut number five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody... What we have to do, Terry, thanks, is fire the white teachers. Cut number four, Terry, at the same rally yesterday. What bothers me to my core is what this man is doing. He's dividing parents against parents, parents against school boards. He's using your children as political pawns in his campaign. It is a racist dog whistle. Folks, we are better you than... You know, I, I stop it. He, he got stuck on stupid with the racist dog whistle stuff. And that calls every voter for Glenn Young kind of racist and people are making up their minds and are concerned about education racist. That's a surefire way to blow up. You will never hear racist dog whistle associated with CRT again after the results tonight. Get out and vote in Virginia. Get out and vote in New Jersey. You don't have to have a Democratic governor there. Get out and vote in Ohio. Elect Tim Butler. Get out and vote and then come back and listen to Glenn Yonka next on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Let me remind you, relieffactor.com. If you're working the polls today in Virginia, you should have had your relieffactor.com. I mean, you, Penny and Jerry, you should have had your relieffactor.com already. I carry it in Kirkham and Rivera, Sean Omega. If you're, if you're standing up or sitting down at a poll, uh, watching job, and there are at least two Yonkin volunteers at every poll in Virginia... If there's any funny business, it will be reported. It will be investigated. You don't have to worry about that. Get out and vote. I know it's raining in a lot of places, so you may not walk. But if you do walk or you do any exercise today, remember, relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com. 1995 gets you relief. I use it every day. I take it in the first hour. I remind you in hours two and three. Don't get left behind. Get relieffactor.com. And then come back here. Glenn Youngkin is next. The next governor of Virginia joins me this morning. Stay tuned. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show brought to you by Sierra Pacific Mortgage. For more info, call 888 1172 Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. Do you realize that Terry McAuliffe is still going around saying that Stacey Abrams had the election in Georgia stolen from her? I thought you weren't allowed to question the, the outcome of the election. And he's running down the democracy saying that our elections are not fair. The next day. She would be the governor of Georgia today had the governor of Georgia not disenfranchised 1.4 million Georgia voters before the election. That's what happened to Stacey Abrams. They took the votes away. Uh-oh. Hey, YouTube, you better ban me because I just played a clip of Democrat Terry McAuliffe claiming that... around the United States, but the governor's race in Virginia has drawn the most attention now. Stacey Abrams had the election stolen from her. That's election misinformation. If Virginia elects Terry McAuliffe next week, you'll deserve every bit of the misery you're going to get. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube and at rumble.com. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. How bullied are you that Americans are finally waking up, J.D.? Look, I'm very excited about what I'm seeing, you know, certainly in Virginia, but also in Ohio. Uh, it feels like there's a real grassroots movement brewing on the conservative movement right now. And it's, you know, j just like in, in times past, it's not just the politicos. It's not just the establishment folks. Sometimes not even people who are that political, but they're just very fired up about what their kids are teaching you know, their, 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 their kids are coming home crying, upset because they're being told that they're, a, you know, a bad person, depending on the color of their skin. And they're just fed up about it. And I think, it, you know, it may very well take down Terry McAuliffe, but I certainly think it is the beginning of a movement all across this country uh, that's going to take down a lot of Democrats all over the all over the nation. In, in the break, we were talking to my team here and uh, somebody said, well, it's neck and neck. And uh, if if. Uh, if Glenn loses by three points, you know, that's a big, big deal in, in any other normal election. And here's the re reaction I have, J.D. 
there are no there is no such thing as a normal election after 2016 do we have any faith that there will be a normal election talk to us about the uh, the, the recent breaking news about uh, facebook and the uh, the uh, censorship of conservatives you've written a piece about it how how do we get back to quote unquote normal jd Oh, man, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, Facebook did two things, basically, in the 2020 election, one of which we've known about for a while. They basically censored information that was negative about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. They promoted information that was negative about Donald Trump. And I really believe uh, that swung the election in a really important way. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway Live on this Tuesday morning election day in Virginia, New Jersey, Ohio, and many places around the United States. But the governor's race in Virginia has drawn the most attention nationally. The Republican nominee for Governor Ter- uh, Gary- Glenn Youngkin joins me now. Uh, good morning, Glenn Youngkin. You ran through the tape last night in Loudoun County. Well, Hugh, we had a big event yes, last night in Lowndes County, but we had a great day yesterday. We had a great 10 days on our bus tour. We started in Roanoke yesterday morning with a giant crowd, and then in Richmond we had a big crowd, and then in, in Virginia Beach, which is where I grew up, we had a huge crowd, and then Loudoun County last night was overwhelming. I mean, I think everybody in Loudoun County was there. It was so <laughs> much fun to see everybody come together and, and really try to bring this home for Virginia. Now, last night, your opponent, Terry McAuliffe, uh, was in a sparse crowd, according to the New York Times. And this is what he had to say that I want to get your comment on. Cut number uh, five. And I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. Fifty Fifty percent of the students in Virginia schools, K-12, 50 percent are students of color. And yet 80 percent of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. So let's diversify. So here's what I'm going to do. So, Glenn Youngkin, I am not concerned about diversity in teachers. I am concerned with whether or not kids are learning. Has Terry McAuliffe just been tone deaf to this for the entire campaign? Yeah, well, I think he's just tone deaf. <laughs> Honestly, I don't, even, don't limit it to this topic. I mean, at the end of the day... We've been talking about low taxes. We've been talking about our schools to educating our children to get ready for life so that they're taught how to think, not what to think, and they have high standards. We, we've been talking about investing in our law enforcement community so that we can make our community safe again and getting our job machine cranked up because it's totally stalled out. I mean, these are the issues that Virginians are most focused on. These are the kitchen table issues that every evening at dinner, and, and oh, by the way, when that midnight shift is finished and that kitchen table's for breakfast, Virginians are talking about. And I don't know what Terry McAuliffe's talking about in all candor. He's trying to find some page out of a playbook that he wrote for the Democratic Party on how to introduce race into this election, when the reality is this election is about Virginia's future, not our past. This is why we're going to sweep today. We've got to get everybody out to vote. Boy, the momentum is big, Hugh, and, and I, just, I just look forward to seeing Virginians come together in a way we haven't done in a long time. The momentum is, in fact, palpable for those of us who live in Virginia with Yunkin signs in the deep bluest parts of the state, including Old Town, Alexandria, Arlington, and Fairfax County. So, Glenn Yunkin, down ticket. You want a lieutenant governor and attorney general. You want a House of Delegates with a Republican majority if you're going to get anything done, Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I, I think it's really going to happen. Winsome Sears, who's our lieutenant governor candidate, is awesome. Jason Miars, who's our attorney general candidate, is going to be an amazing attorney general. And I think we're going to get back six, seven, eight seats in our House of Delegates, and we're going to have a working majority. But of course, the Senate's still going to be controlled by the, by the Democrats because the Senate's not up. And so we're going to work across the aisle. I think when we focus on these most important issues of low taxes and the best jobs and the best schools and the safest communities, these are the These are the issues that we can come together around. We've got a really clear agenda on day one we're going to go work on and get done and deliver results.
There's a lot of talent in Virginia, Governor. I've lived here off and on my whole life. And in southwest Virginia and northeast Virginia, in the Tidewater or out in the West Virginia border, there are a lot of very talented people who have made Virginia their home. How are you going to put together your team if you win tonight? Well, we're going we're to have a team that represents all of Virginia. And I think one of the things we're going to do, Hugh, is, is we're going to shift power away from the Marble Halls in Richmond, and we're going to get out into Virginia. And so people always say to me, well, Glenn, we're gonna, can we have a meeting in Richmond? And I say, no, I'm going to see you. And so we're looking forward to spending time across Virginia and bringing all this talent that you're exactly right exists everywhere to go to work for all Virginians. And I was in southwest Virginia on Sunday. We had a series of fabulous events. And, yeah, there are a lot of incredibly talented folks, not only to help us, help us serve Virginians, but to go to work and lead initiatives, lead initiatives to make everybody's life in southwest Virginia better. Last question, Glenn Young. And the Wall Street Journal today reports that farewell offshoring, outsourcing, pandemic rewrites, CEO, CEO playbook. American businesses are bringing factories back to the United States. They're going to look for a place to land. How do you make Virginia come back? I, I remember Rick Perry coming over to California with sticky fingers gloves and grabbing businesses. How do you do that for Virginia to get these jobs into the Commonwealth? Well, we're going to make sure that everybody knows Virginia is open for business. We're going to protect our right to work status, which has been under threat recently, and it will not be when I'm serving Virginia as governor. But we're going to cut our regulations way back. The Virginia Code is 37,000 pages long. We're going to get a tax structure in place that, that makes it more affordable for Virginians to live here so people want to work for these great companies. And, and hey, we're going to go get them. And the reality is Virginia's forgotten how to compete. We've just kind of sat here and thought that people might just show up because we keep re- 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 receiving these CNBC rankings. Well, rankings don't do anything for you. You've got to go get it. And so one of the things I've done in 30 years is I know how to build business and create jobs, and I know how to go get business. And so this is where we're going to go. And, and all those other governors that I so look forward to com- having a healthy competition with across the nation, get ready because Virginians awake again. Clear eyes, clean heart. Glenn Youngkin, congratulations on a great campaign. And to Mrs. Youngkin and the kids who have been there every step of the way with you, good luck today. I know you'll be working the polls throughout the state. Throughout Election Day, polls are open in Virginia. They will stay open until 7 p.m. tonight. So get out and vote, Virginia. I'm Hugh Hewitt from the Beltway. Stay tuned. Curious about what you're missing in the universe? The After Show? 21 years of Hugh Hewitt shows on demand? Go to www.huniverse.com right now where it's only 99 cents to join.